everybody, Patrick Hunter here, and welcome to the Knuckles and Gloves podcast. More heavyweight action. It's been heavyweights, fucking Lollapalooza in the last couple fucking weeks, bro. But hey, I'll take it. I mean, I know you love the heavyweights. Heavyweights are fun. I'm here with my boy, Eris Pina, copy box operator, and of course, a history file like myself. Again, heavyweights. Eris, what's up, bro? How's everything, my man? Yeah, it's been a long thing. Um, lots of heavyweights been talked about. We had the big heavyweight title fight the other weekend. Um, this coming weekend, um, you have the big fight between Wilder and Big Bang Zang, which in terms of its significance, it doesn't really hit up there on the hierarchy of how it's going to affect the division. But, you know, it's supposed to probably going to produce a lot of fireworks. So, His, his Excellency... Wait, hold on. Why is I gotta I gotta stop it? Why excellence? Why is is he really excellent? Why excellency? Because he's I okay. don't know anything about this dude to be honest. All right, I haven't. And I'm it's not be, Majesty because he's not part of the royal family. I don't think so. He's not. But why is that? Ex- that's weird. Whatever. But homeboy Turkey Al Sheikh, yeah. he's putting together all these fights, and it seems like he's got something for the heavyweights, which I, I get. Because the heavyweights draw, they're fun, they're big, they fall, they're crazy, etc. And I mean, yeah, that's kind of what we're we've gotten some investment into in in Riyadh. We talked a little bit about that on the last show, which again, I feel like it's almost not fair to like get into it half assed, but nonetheless, that's kind of what we're heavyweights dude they they want to see the heavyweight division kind of hashed out which at the very least all the other stuff aside i'm kind of grateful for that they're hashing this thing out i mean totally the heavyweight division throughout history has always been well first the most significant one because it's heavyweight and whoever's been the heavyweight champion usually especially you know in the past history wise has always been viewed as the man you know what i mean just universally all over and um as sanctioned bodies started clawing their way into the boxing realm and things started happening you know the heavyweight division as every other division in boxing became very muddled but because it's the heavyweight division it really sticks out more so because again that's the glamour division of it all so when you hear all these people back you know years ago and rightfully so complaining oh you know the heavyweight division is all messed up and we don't have a unified champion and we don't know who champ is anymore and everybody can be a champion and yada 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 and I mean, that was the same consensus for a number of years because you had these promoters who had a piece of the pie, you had their and their fighters, but very rarely were they actually getting together and actually you're know, trying to unify the belts unless it was going to benefit everybody involved. You know, the last time that happened again was Lennox Lewis Evander Holyfield. But look how long that fight took to get made in that point. You know, what I mean, Don King had basically control of the division with all the sanctioned bodies. So he just was able to do what he wanted to do. You know, you had Evander Holyfield and Riddick Bowe and other champions during that time, but no one could just really get together and just make the super fight that wanted to be made until the end of that decade. And then again, once everything split up again after Lewis retired, um, I mean, they were already split up again by that point, but everyone considered Lewis the consensus champion. But I mean, once everything was split up again, it, look how long it took. No one was going to unify. Then we went through the Klitschko era where those two were not going to fight each other because they were brothers. And it took up until around now, 2023, 2024, and his excellency or whatever the hell you want to call him, you know, Sheik over there started doing his thing. Like, you know, he, he was like, all right, well, I'm going to start throwing money out there. But that was the type of money that would entice these guys to actually do something. You know, it's like that type of money. Where you can't say no to it. And even though we don't know the ethical things of that money or whatever it may be the fights are getting made regardless now and so the heavyweight division is looked upon in a better light than it has in a long time because the fights people want to see are actually getting made and we have a unified champion even though it looks like the ibf belt might be getting stripped in a second anyways yeah you you said the magic words though dude it's all about money um totally ultimately it's like and and this is i think this is what's very difficult to explain to a casual fan or somebody who's new to boxing who just thinks like, what doesn't it make the most sense to have one champion, a single champion, regardless of belts or what, you know what I'm saying? Like, doesn't it make the most sense to just have one champion? And you're thinking like, yeah, like it it does, I guess. But as far as the sanctioning bodies are concerned, as far as money is concerned, it's, it makes more financial sense for promoters. It makes more financial sense for sanctioning bodies 
to split them up and to have their own champions, have multiple championship fights, multiple sources of income, essentially. And, you know, you, you'll hear from like the WBC, for instance, will they say, oh, we're like a nonprofit organization or a not-for-profit, whatever, however they categorize themselves, which makes no sense because how the fuck are they having these like multiple lavish conventions per year and all this, you know, who's, who are they just have like these fucking wealthy, like people footing who just feel like fucking like getting into box. Come on, dude. It, it, that's not how this works. It's all big money laundering operation. That's it. Boxing. That is the entire sport of boxing. So in any case, uh, money's the name of the game, dude, being able to kind of have an entity like whoever's behind all of this in Saudi Arabia, basically just stepping in and saying like, I got so much money, just name a fucking price. Like what's, what's the limit here? That's what it sounds like they're doing. They're going to fighters who are going like, whoa, I can't like double cross a promoter or I can't like, you know, I can't do this or I'm contractually obligated to this or my minimum is this. And if you ain't meeting my minimum, then, you know, get to walking. And instead they're just coming in with so much money and saying like, fuck your minimum, we'll triple it. And they're going like, all right, like, what, what are you going to do? Absolutely. I mean, look, first off, I always kind of hoped when I worked for uh, Lou and then Cedric over the years that I would get sent to one of those conventions as one of their representatives because they because they want to. She looks live, dude, for real. Absolutely, and I'm not gonna lie. Who wouldn't want to go to Cancun or one of the other random locations? It's it's always in some bomb ass spot. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I'd be down for that. I'm not gonna front if they sent me out there to have like. <gasps> Is on up behalf of their fighters, I would have done that in a heartbeat and taken exactly. That we're only talking shit because we're on this side. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but <laughs> that being said, though, like you said, um, it's it's a fascinating thing how this is taking place. So we'll see how long that'll last. You know, um, I know that he wants to expand, and he has been um, uh, Turkey Alashik. That is outside of just working with um, who was it, Frank Warren and um, uh, her matchroom. Like now, I guess he, you know, he's being able to do business now with uh, with PVC, or he's starting to. Like, well, let me look at this card that's coming up, right? Um, and others, you know, other things for that matter. So he's really trying to make an effort to think that he's going to be like the overall face of boxing. And yeah, it's an interesting time. Well, and it's I think the a convenient time. It's the right time. It's good timing okay. on his part because right now is a very transitional period for boxing in terms of the technology that's available for sure. streaming and apps and all those sorts of things. Whereas before it was terrestrial TV channels, HBO, Showtime, and those kinds of things, CBS. Uh, I mean, those some of those things are still in the boxing game in one way or another, but uh, not the same way, not in a traditional way. Things are changing and contracts, I think broadcasting rights and things like that are changing. And so that's forcing a lot of these companies to kind of think outside the box and look who's waiting outside the box, bro. Turkey Al Sheikh, he's just standing there going, what's up? Got some money. So that's, I think that's pretty yeah, much what we're some at. incredible promos for his fights, even though they get annoying as shit that you see on those ads on Twitter to the point where I'm almost thinking about muting him at this point. But I, yeah, it's like you, they get overplayed, but they're cool though. Um, they're very cool, but it's, here's the thing, because like you know how you get ads on Twitter and they're always showing. I thought yeah. they were done after the after the um Fury Usyk fight, and then immediately the very next day it just switches to the five on five card. <laughs> I'm just like, all right, enough is enough. But if you just watch the actual things, I mean, look how much money they're pumping into all their production and all that. It's pretty fascinating stuff. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's it's still well, tough, I will say, to reproduce the atmosphere because thus far the atmosphere is just not there. And I get oh, it. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there are basically the only uh, – I'll just speak frankly, bro. Like, you know, anybody can get mad at me if they want, but I'm not really <coughs> involved in boxing, so nobody – I don't know what they get mad at. But basically what it sounds like is that a lot of people are getting paid to go there and uh, cover favorably – the fight cards and the atmosphere and the country and how they're treated and the trip and all this sorts of stuff and cool, whatever, dude, you know, they can make their money however they want to make their money. Uh, but thus far in terms of just getting traditional fight media, boxing media, those kinds of things like actually involved in making trips to Saudi Arabia to cover a fight card for a week or whatever, financially, that's not sustainable 
for the market or for the environment of boxing media right now, which is kind of in the shitter. And there's there aren't very many outlets that could really cover that sort of thing. And so my point is that the atmosphere, if their fans can't go, you know, you're not going to make a fucking week trip to Saudi Arabia to go see the five on five card, regardless of how many of the fights you like. Again, it's just not feasible, not logistically you know, it doesn't make sense. So the atmosphere isn't really there. And that's really thus far the only thing that's kind of lacking, but it's a, it's a significant thing. But like you said, um, you know, might have their hands in more kind of outside Saudi Arabia promotions. Yeah. So, I mean, look, at the end of the day, for now, I mean, people are getting fights that they normally wouldn't be getting. So it's a good time to be a boxing fan. And um, this Saturday, uh, is an example of that. This, you know, again, I'm not sure the significance of where it's going to be on the whole spectrum of the heavyweight division, but it's just going to be a good ass fight. It should be on paper, you know, between Wilder and Zayn. Like you got two guys who both coming off losses, you know, to the same opponent, Joseph Parker, and both of them were kind of somewhat list, uh, listless in that fight. I say somewhat for Zayn and completely for Wilder because Wilder did absolutely nothing in that fight, but. Zane, at least when he decided to throw his hands, clearly he could hurt Parker and drop him and stuff. He just didn't do it enough. But um, um, so yeah, it's one of those fights that the reason why we're having our discussion today is that it's you know on paper this could be a slugfest, a wild one where there could be multiple knockdowns and you know finishing up with a conclusive knockout. And I think that's what we're all hoping for. One guy is in his late thirties, mm -hmm. gone through a significant amount of punishment uh, as a heavyweight, at least, and even just in three fights against Tyson Fury. You know, he took sure. took some shots, and in other fights as well. Uh, Big Bang Zhang, he's forty one, but has had a far more condensed uh, professional career, and doesn't really seem kind of as worn, at least not from the punches themselves. Sure. As Deontay Wilder, but being 41, bro, I'm 41. Fucking you kidding me, bro. I hit the bag for three rounds and I'm done. But <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then I and then I nurse a fucking shoulder injury for two weeks. But no, like, you know, it's it, the guy is not young and he doesn't look young. He doesn't really fight young. Uh, he does kind of conserve his energy here and there. However, he's a puncher, he's got a funky style, he's a southpaw. He he's uh, moves better than you think that he would move for his size. And he's not super fast, but you don't need to be super fast against Deontay Wilder. And that's, that's why I think you say this is, this has the potential to be slug festy for sure. No question. I mean, not to say that Parker was very nimble on his feet, but he's quickly quicker on his feet than Zang was. Zang is not a guy that moves super well. Like he moves, and he tries to, you know, create angles. He's not just a walk-ahead slugger, but he's not nimble on his feet, and he has a lot of weight on him as well. Like, he's a big guy. So he's going to be more in line for a shot of, like, you know, Wilder's type power, like, right there to get hit by, as opposed to a guy who's clearly going to be, you know, conventional and make sure he's not going to get hit with anything like that. And um, but Zane just has that type of power, too. Like, we've seen it now where he's destroyed Joy, Joy, uh, Joy, uh, Joe Joyce twice. And um, what he was able to do to Parker and others. And um, he's clearly gotten over well, what happened to him that last time where he clearly almost died in the ring. And um, who was he fighting? Jerry Forrest, I think. Oh, man. I don't even what, what yeah, I'd have to look again. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was yeah. that one. But oh, my so, God, dude. That was, well, that like, was he wild. He looked like hell. And then it was like, oh, okay, that's why he looked like hell because he almost Jerry. died. But, you know, he has that type of power where it's almost i'm not i'm not uh, like comparing him to foreman but like it's the type of power where he clear like it's been seen that he doesn't have to touch you that hard and you still go down from like parker didn't seem like he got hit with anything i mean i haven't watched it since that day but i don't recall parker getting hit with anything that looked like oh my god and he just went down still in a heat from you know what i mean um the joyce fight yeah when he got dropped that was a massive shot but still then it's just very like methodical and do do boom like he's just going through the motions it's that type of like clubbing power, you know? And that's serious shit. When you get hit with that type of stuff, when you have a guy that could be so just like <clears throat> nonchalant how he throws it instead of just getting ready to wind up to do it, it's like, 
not what's up. You know what I mean? Zayn has that type of power. And he has really good fundamentals. You can't just call him anything like that. Like, he knows how to work behind his jab. He's a former Olympian. Um, He's had ex you know, extensive amateur background as well of everything like that. And he knows how to put his punches together. He throws well in combinations. And he's a southpaw. Like... All you know, combining and all of that, he's a difficult night for anybody, and that's why he matches well with everybody in the division. But fun wise and style wise, this one would wow. There, like you can't get anything better than that. He had a pretty, he had a pretty, uh, I would say, accurate or proper, you know, guidance uh, to to this moment. Um, he should have defeated Hergovic, who uh, he, that that should have been a fairly clear win for him, but he got totally jobbed. And he was even managed to keep the Parker fight pretty close. I thought Parker rightly won the fight, but even so, like you said, he was in major danger at a couple different points just from barely getting touched. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Parker's kind of on a little bit of a roll right now too. So you got to hand it to him and see if he's able to fit in against the winner of the Usyk Fury rematch, most likely. But nonetheless, this is kind of that next tier, um, you know, Zhang versus Wilder. So, I mean, on the other hand, though, you have Deontay Wilder, who's like, I don't know what to figure with him. Um, a lot of what's going on with him and a lot of the kind of mystery seems to be, I almost said psychiatric, <laughs> like psychological. <laughs> but I mean, you know. I mean, honestly, speaking kind of frankly, uh, I know myself and a lot of other people were worried about him after the Tyson Fury rematch where he, remember, he posted some of the weird-ass social media videos and he was like, I'm really upset, but don't worry because I'm not upset at all, but he was kind of going yeah, off yeah. the rails. And then he um, said he could feel an egg weight and all this other stuff. And, oh, and the, and the fucking costume and the yeah yeah the gloves which has just been done to death and it's just caught the brunt of it all too yeah 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 bro it's yeah it's it's been a ride it's definitely been a ride and so yeah you know mark breland wound up getting sacked which did no good for him whatsoever of course and then now we've seen just a completely different wilder against joseph parker yeah. that was like the most passive dude was talking about ayahuasca Dude was talking, you know, he's talking about going on transcendental journeys and great for him. I mean, it sounds like he's in a different place as a human being, which is like, it sounds like he's kind of beyond boxing. That's what it sounds like. Sure. And in the lead up to this fight, it almost sounds like he's kind of trying to make himself go back to the, I want a body type of shit, you know, where it's like, you don't sound like you want a body anymore. You kind of sound like yeah. you just want to go back and smoke some weed, which is all good with me. But I do wonder, you know, I mean, like, which Deontay Wilder is going to be showing up against Zalil Zali Zang, dude? Which which one do you think is going to be showing up? I I'm not sure. Like, I know, I hope that he realizes that his back is against the wall. Like, losing this fight or losing it like really badly is going to be the end for him. You know what I mean? Like, how many times he'll still be exciting, but at that point, he's just going to be used that you know as a stepping stone, if anything. For other prospects if he's willing to even go that route which i don't think he would he didn't sound upset at all that he lost to joseph parker like he yeah, was just kind of like it happens whatever sure. he looked awful but that being said i'm favoring zang in this fight you know wilder looked horrible in his last fight um he only got half, um one round in with um was it hellenius when he splattered him before that and he went through the three fury fights like He's, I think he's kind of on the back end right now. And not to say that um, Zang is in his absolute prime. Like you said, he's only 40, you know, he's 41. But I think he has, you know, a little less wear and tear on himself. Um, he had a good performance in his last fight, even though Parker was, was able to edge him out. He didn't embarrass himself or anything like that. And like I said, you know, like we both said, he looked very good. He's kind of like tired out near the end of it. But like not like completely gassed. He just kind of, you know, let off the gas. But that being said, I think he's just the, the more complete fighter at this point. And, and unless Wilder does land a massive right hand, which clearly can't happen and potentially will happen, um, I think Zane stops him. That's the question. Can yeah. Wilder, you know, pull it out? Can he sure, reach? I'm going, I'm going with Zane by stoppage in this one. I think that's a I think that's a good bet. I mean stoppage, like you know, around round nine or so, he gets around, he gets him out of there. 
I, I feel like that's a pretty good bet. Because, I mean, you know, you talk about – you kind of have to apply the puncher's chance type of thing to Wilder. And a lot yeah. of people use that term like it's a good thing, but it's not a good thing. Like a puncher's chance is small. A puncher's chance is not good. So, you know, when somebody goes like, oh, I think he's got it, it's the old puncher's chance. Yeah. You're referencing something where, you know, the puncher's chance is not a good chance. And so I think that's what we're looking at here is Deontay Wilder does have that puncher's chance, but that's not a good chance. Um, he's a man. And and that's discounting that he's going to be getting hit from the other guy who can also punch. Yeah. So and he can be hurt from that. Like he still he says punch resistance is not all there anymore. Never really has been there from the jump. Like he's been hurt earlier in his career. Um, he was dropped very early on against Harold uh, Journeyman Harold Scorniers. He was hurt um, a couple of other times before he won the title. Clearly hurt one um against Luis Ortiz and a couple of like you know what I mean Wilder's always like he's you know he's really tall and lanky and skinny like he has that Tommy Hearns type power and massive one punch knockout power but his he punch was stopped like a couple times as an amateur too like there's a video of it okay. he looks yeah. you know he gets flopped around pretty good sure he's just he has that type of chin where like I mean he has incredible heart and he's proven to be one of those guys that when he's hurt he's extremely dangerous because he's come back from that and but. I don't know right now, man. Like, you know, I think the, the Fury fights took a lot out of him. And he hasn't been active enough, considering, you know, even from the Parker fight to to be ready for something like this. This is like another big fight being thrown into for him. This is the last chance for him. So I hope that he takes it as not as, you know, fights like his trainer, Malik Scott, and instead goes back to being what he was. But you got to remember, too, even when he was that all-in-out bomber, he wasn't Mr. Activity with throwing a ton of punches. Like, he just never was that guy, you know what I mean? He's always been the one just kind of waiting and probing and probing and then just throwing a you know a shot out there out of the blue that takes the guy out. But he's been getting here. <clears> he's been times of him that he's had to come back from, like, you know, massive points uh, points deficits to be able to do that. So I'm just using all of that in my thought process of him thinking that he's going to lose this one, you know? I No, I agree. And, uh, again, he could still win because of that power, but – he does the impression that I get, and I agree with your call, by the way. I think that it's probably like, you know, Zhang like late or something like that is probably a good call. But I think that uh, Wilder has always struck me, even as a champion, even as somebody who, who held a belt, as somebody who was like a fighter who kind of thought he was something that he wasn't. Yeah. Like he thought he boxed a lot better and a lot more skillful than he really did. And the fact that he wound up being able to get the stoppage so many times almost like reinforced that in his head incorrectly. And so then he would go, he would kept going into fights thinking like, oh, my skill is getting me there when it's, you know, and, and that's not to say he's without skill because then you're kind of, you know, missing the forest for the trees there because he does have to have some amount of skill to land that power. But nonetheless, he thought I, you know, he's like it, like a in terms of skill, like it, like a three or four, you know. And yeah. he thought he was like at a seven or eight. And, and you so, would see those videos too of him doing like the spins and all that, and he's still yeah, doing like in sparring where like he thought he was being slick, and you're like, bro, <laughs> these guys are getting paid to not whoop your ass right now with yeah. all due respect. <laughs> like, you know, they're they'd really be punching you if they could, but like, but nonetheless, again the uh his punching power and his that one thing that he had he's so specialized and good at it that he could figure out how to land that power so that being said yeah it's it's uh it's almost like i'm trying to talk myself into he, that he's into this fight but no i, I just... think he is he's still alive i mean he's still alive as hell on it would not shock me in the least if he landed a bomb that took zang out i just happen to think <laughs> that zang just has too much for him right now at this right. point it's yeah. not at the right point in either of their careers for us to believe that will happen. Exactly. And especially what, he, what he's coming off of right now. So, yep. So that being said, we both think that Zhang's most likely going to win this weekend, but it could be a slugfest, could be a lot of bombs landed, or or just a few bombs landed. But we're talking about heavyweight slugfests otherwise, or whatever you want to call them, puncher versus puncher, just fights that wound up tearing down the house right sure we'll just try to jam in as many as we can because you know some of these they're going to be probably fairly famous or famous enough that you know all the history behind it but what's one you got to get out of there dude 
you know, it's not even just one. It's actually with one fighter because he had a few of them. And that's, um, you know, he has a lot of guys that had incredible wars in the 70s for the heavyweight division. You name them. You already know the names of all of them. There's Foreman Lyle and there's Ali and Frazier and yabby yabby, all these other guys. But like one of my all time favorites was Ernie Shavers. Ernie Shavers was involved in a lot of wild ass brawls in the 70s, even in the 1980 for that matter. Uh -huh. They're at the tail end of his career. And, you know, and so, yeah, I was going to mention Shavers because a few of my favorite wild brawls involving heavyweights involved him. And that was Roy Tiger Williams. Absolute awesome fight that doesn't get talked about enough today, including one of the most dramatic finishes you'd ever see. Um, his fight with Ron Lyle, uh, and his two fights in the early 80s, in 1980, in fact, uh, against Tex Cobb, and then Bernardo Macardo. Lost three of them out of the four, but again, all incredible wars, and Shavers was just that type of dude who just made for fantastic fights, whether he won or lost. Some of the, some of the more... Uh like entertaining fights that he had like a lot of the the major fights that he had that he had or the more famous fights the that he had or that he was on the losing end was like him in pursuit yeah for a bunch of rounds and not being able to land anything but then a few rounds where he landed some bombs and that shit was dramatic as fuck right sure. like probably his most famous fights but some of the best fights were yeah some of the ones that you mentioned were that are far lesser known but you got to go look up on youtube or whatever but are fun as hell because they were just like being honest about Ernie Shavers. Um, I mean, I'm not going to talk him down at all. And you ain't going to catch me standing in front of a punch from Ernie Shavers. Even the, if the guy were like in his seventies, I don't want him to punch me at all. And you hear guys like Ali, uh, you hear Norton, uh, oh, a, a bunch of different other fighters saying like, Oh, that's the hardest puncher I ever came across. And I'm not saying they're lying. However, it's like, you know, the the record doesn't really match what they're saying. You know, what I, you know what I mean? Like he lost most of, if not all of his biggest fights and most of them by stoppage, too, because of that kind of puncher's paradox that we've mentioned mentioned before, where they have massive power, but not a great chin or not great punch resistance for one reason or another. So, I mean, I do think that Shavers probably gets a little bit overrated in terms of his, you know overall rating as a heavyweight or whatever but again massive massive puncher and that's why some of these other kind of like second tier fights were the were the good ones oh i mean they're incredible like his fight with roy targa williams in particular was just absolute wild wild brawl roy targa williams was a heavyweight from that era and you know the heavyweight division in the 70s is so stacked and so packed up that like it's comparable with other like generations of like music and stuff where like you have such a heavy like the new jack swing era right you have so many people that came out with so so much great music but only the top people were getting like the were getting all the attention like new edition and johnny gill and you know this one and the keith sweat and all these other people that all these other ones that were making incredible music it just kind of gets lost over the years because they were just stacked up in that, that type of era. You know what I mean? Think of the same thing with the heavyweight division of the 70s. You have Ali and Frazier and Foreman and Norton and, you know, Shavers, Lyle, and all these other guys that people fondly remember and talk about in these, in the, in these uh, round robins. And then you have a whole host of these guys from that same generation that would have been taught, that were top contenders. I mean, they weren't top, top contenders of that era. But they were contenders, and they fought everybody and a host of everyone else, and they were tough as nails. And Roy Tiger Williams was one of those guys that would fit into that type of thing. You know what I mean? He's forgotten today, but anyone from that era would tell you that he was an absolute monster and tough, tough dude. Like, and he never really got stopped by, you know, I think Shavers was his only stoppage loss. Like, he went the distance with Larry Holmes. I think Holmes broke his hands on him, you know, show you how tough he was. And um, a host of other guys, a big, burly dude who apparently wasn't very friendly either. Right? Like, I mean, he was a surly guy who just kind of kept to himself and kind of, you know, kept up the monkey or tiger, like scary individual. Anyways, his fight with Shavers, those two beat the shit out of each other, right? Like, you know, it's on grainy film. It's from like the mid to late seventies. I've got the exact year, but the end of it, the ending of it is so like awesome where Shavers is getting pummeled. He's in the corner, just getting pummeled and pummeled and pummeled. And it looks like, Williams is gonna, you know, get a stoppage victory over them. Then it gets broken up a little bit. Williams gets exhausted. Shavers comes lumbering back and starts landing back on him and starts landing some incredible punches. Crowd's going crazy. Finally, 
when like the referee finally breaks them up and like he's gonna stop it or like try to break them up for a second because Shavers is like all over him. And then he breaks it up and then Tiger Williams just collapses in like dramatic fashion. Right, Pat? <laughs> There's a couple of those, excuse me, uh, there are a couple of those Ernie Shavers fights where it's like he's on the brink, dude. It looks yeah. like he's about to go out or it looks like he's like done. He's exhausted. And it's almost it's almost like Samson or something like the, the the crowd cheering or something like gives him strength. And he goes from like, uh, uh, like draping all over to all of a sudden he's just like, ah, and like attacking shit. It's, it's yeah. actually kind of scary, bro. It, yeah. I'm looking right now to see what it was. It was, uh, yeah, that, that fight was just absurd. And so, um, it was in 1977 in Vegas at the Aladdin. And he was stopped in round 10, I think. And that's, it was just like, he collapses just dramatically right over there. They get pulled apart and then you just see him fall over. Boom! Like he just, you know, he just couldn't take anymore. And that was one of those type of fights that not only salvaged Shavers' his career, but like kept him on the popular route to always get these type of fights. Like after he lost to Larry Holmes the first time, um, he lost that fight by a wide decision, you know? And after he knocked out Norton in round one, which was pretty impressive in itself, um, he gets that rematch with with uh, with Holmes. And when you look on in a paper, I mean, yeah, you know, Shavers was a popular fighter and all that, but, like, if you watched their first fight, why would you think anything was going to be different in their second fight, you know? And, I mean, if you was going through, through the Twitter era today, I can't imagine how many people would be that excited about a rematch of them. But then look what Shavers ends up doing. Like he scores one of the most dramatic knockdowns in boxing history. Where <laughs> if it was any other person on the planet, or if it was any type so of you know, loud. Jeez. Fuck, yes. dude. No? And well, and I mean it's that kind of shit too, where like, you know, I you consider it just a couple minutes ago said, like, oh, I think Shavers is a little bit overrated. Well then how is him landing a massive bomb on, you know, why would I even care? But I, he could be over late, overrated, but still a huge, massive puncher because he obviously was. Yeah. He was a he was a free swinging puncher and not a small guy. He was a good sized guy, you know, and obviously you know muscular and had good technique as far as punching, as far as getting power on his punches, and he knew how to do it. And that one shot, you know, uh, Holmes just lapsed for just a second and kind of squared up with him, caught that fucking right hand, and holy shit, he was dead. He was clinically dead before he hit the canvas and then, you know, got revived. Somebody was like, clear, when he hit the canvas. And he was like, oh, and somehow fucking not only made it up, but stopped him a few rounds later. What the fuck, Larry? And, you know, that was the first time the world got to see the recuperative powers of Holmes. Like, he was hurt in the Norton fight and showed, you know, he was waning in that. And He had lapses. Yes, he had many I lapses. Think, and I, I know, I don't, don't think wake him up. Look, there's any video footage sure some collector out there is hoarding it but there is there was he was dropped in one of his early fights against kevin isaac i believe but anyways this was the first time the world got to see anyone for that matter live television get up from the from death like that like you said like he fell down he just lay there unconscious and holmes always said that if not if not if shavers didn't hit him as hard as he did he probably would have been knocked out because he said the force of it and him hitting the canvas is what kind of jolted him awake from that like everything the the combination of that jolted him back away and he was like wait what just happened oh 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 my god wow okay and then he got up and did what he had to do but you know you have that fight with tiger williams the fight with ron lyle that one's more popular than the other ones i've mentioned because that was you know between two of their most popular sluggers of the of the era and again when that fight was made you just knew there was going to be guaranteed fireworks of it because you just have two guys who are not going to run away from each other like lyle could box and, you know, I got to give him more credit as a boxer than others do, but, like, he was not a person that was going to sh slug, you know, shy away from a slugfest. Like, you saw what he ended up doing for me. He was going to stand his ground and fight with you. And it almost cost him early on. Like, Shavers caught him, and Shavers dropped him heavily, you know, with a shot. And um, Lyle mentioned that on the uh, documentary Facing Ali when he was talking about fighting Shavers because when the Shavers segment came up, all the fighters – that Ali had in the interview inevitably had fought Shavers at some point or another, at least almost all of them. And they all mentioned the same thing, man, Ernie Shavers, blah, blah, blah. And so when they mentioned Lyle and they showed Lyle getting dropped, then they were like, man, Shavers would hit me with a shot. My legs came up and I just landed straight on my ass. 
And he started laughing. He said, no man ever hit me like that in my life. <laughs> that's, that's the truth. Yeah, exactly. In almost any other era, he would have been a champion or he would have been something else. Yeah, yeah. You know? uh, and that's, it's funny too, because that famous quote from Ali, like that, I actually... The first time I ever saw it, because I looked for it in the newspaper, that whole, like, you know, he hit me so hard, he shook my kinfolk in Africa. Well, I looked for that because I was like, I got to know where he said this. When did he say this? Like, where did this come from? And the first time I ever uh, saw it or could find it was him saying that Jimmy Ellis told him that. He <laughs> said, he said, yeah, Jimmy Ellis told me that he hit him so hard it jarred his kinfolk in Africa. And then he just started using that line for himself because I think it probably got a pretty good pop because it was... But it's yeah. a good line. It's a funny it line. Great. Yeah. But, but um, it, it's the truth. And so it's it's the absolute truth. That was that type of power he had. So like that was an absolute war. And you know, another one too. That was a back and forth fight that again though Shaver shows his limitations because Lyle was able to stand up to his heat. He got dropped, he was able to recover. Somehow, by the grace of God, he was able to let you know handle more bombs that came his way because I don't know how anyone can do that, but he did. And he was able to viciously knock out Shavers. It wasn't like a stoppage. Like, Shavers was laid out on the canvas, out. And um, that was a big win for Lyle. That was the one that I think that catapulted him again back into the highlights of the division. So fast forward now to 1980, and now Shavers, it's the end. like I said, now it's the end of an era, all right? He's a part of that generation, like other, like every generation, where there's just like a pocket of guys from the decade before, or even like, 15 years or whatever, 20, they've just been lingering around. And they're still kind of there as a name, way past their best, but they're still there and they have enough of a name that they're going to be used and they're going to be put in high profile bouts to a degree because they're going to provide rounds and sometimes bring an upset or two. And Shavers was a part of that group, you know. Um, and the thing about Shavers, though, is that now he has slowed up even more. He was never Mr. Graceful at fast to begin with, but now he like slowed to an absolute crawl, just kind of shuffled along could be outboxed for pockets at a time but he still just had that power that was absolutely ridiculous so when he got matched up with tex cobb on um uh in detroit on the undercard of uh hearns Cuevas, that was one of those old-fashioned donnie brooks slugfests where like you know neither guy tried to back up to, to to do anything like it was absurd tex cobb was undefeated at that point you know, former kickboxer that just a regular tough guy that ended up in Philadelphia and somehow was being trained by George Benton. And that's hilarious to me and anyone that knows George Benton, because if you know the style of Tex Cobb and you know George Benton, that is the absolute most opposite of mix-ups you could possibly imagine, you know? <laughs> like that that shot of George Benton looking fucking pissed and with his arms over the ropes. Oh, yeah, yeah, with all of them a call, yeah. <laughs> that That is exactly how I imagine him in the gym trying to train Tex Cobb, just going <laughs> like, fucking pivot. What the fuck? <laughs> you know, Tex Cobb just... Hands yeah. up, please. <laughs> you know how to block. I've showed you this a thousand times. <laughs> but, I mean, that was just a brutal, brutal fight. Cobb was on the way up. Um, even though he was limited, he was still just tough as nails. And he was just a slug. He was, and he was a bruiser, too. All right? Like, he accumulated enough punishment on you, you'd feel it. And so, Shavers, though, during that fight, was landing bomb after bomb. Because Cobb wasn't moving from it, right? You just see these right hands. Boom! And boom. Yeah, and he and, had just shaggy enough hair that you could see him yes. just like flap, 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 flap. That's exactly what I was gonna say. That his shaggy hair would go flying all over the place, and like it was dimly lit, so it just kind of gave the even gave him more of an impression of like a barroom brawl type atmosphere. And um, yeah, Shavers was old, it withered. He gave everything he gave, but like you can only punch a man so many times, like Tex Cobb, and realize it's just for naught. And he withered away and got stopped. And then um. Same well before I move on to the last fight, really briefly, like one thing I did hear from a couple of people is that they said that George Benson was ringside, and that every time, I mean, you know, clearly because he was a uh, cop's trainer at the time, and he said that every time that um, every time that Cobb got hit with a massive shot, George Benton would cringe and go because oh, no. <laughs> he was always freaking out. They said every time he's just going, oh God, God. <laughs> he probably did that a lot that night then. I'm sure he was. Yeah, they yeah, said pretty much every night. Come fight, on, let's be real. Going like, oh man, like come on, bro. Yeah, Tex Cobb did not have great defense, so he probably did that every night. Every night he fought. Yeah, yeah, but I just, that was a great fight. I mean, they do play that. They played that a lot for whatever reason on classic sports. 
ESPN Classic Sports back in the day, that was one fight that they used to play a lot. I and mean, I had no problem with it because it's a fun fight to watch. But, um, you know, it's available on YouTube, whatever. But the last one was uh, Bernard, Bernardo Mercado. And, you know, we've stuck, discussed Mercado on the show before. Uh, top, he could have he fought for the title back in the early, early 80s. He was a good fighter, had some good wins, but limited in what he could do at the very spectrum of it all. But, like, same thing. Shavers is old and washed, and Mercado's kind of beating him up early on. I don't know if it was the first round or second round or whatever round it was, but Shavers, again, uncorks one of those massive shots out of nowhere because he still could chuck him, and if you were going to stand in front of him, they were going to hurt. And boom, Mercado dropped like all those other heavyweights used to in the 70s. Just went flat. It wasn't no flash knockdown. He got knocked flat on his ass really hard, looked at them like, holy shit. And I actually love this response by Mercado. He kept on going, yeah, yeah, like pointing at Shavers, like, no, you got me, motherfucker. Like, yeah, yeah, you got me, you got me, no doubt. Like, wow, it's real. Like, he was almost like he was like, you can almost, he like, he was smiling, like almost taking the sense. It almost gave me the sense that he was just like, holy shit, like this was what everybody talked about. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like those fools who get bitten by the insects, like on purpose. And they're like, yeah. wow, this thing's as much as I was told. And you're like, you're exactly. fucking weird, bro. That was literally the face of Ricardo when he kept on giving Shavers his props. It was almost like, holy shit, this is what Ali and all of them were actually saying. This is real. <laughs> Well, Mercado was, uh, you know, it was a dude from Colombia who had come to the United States in the like mid seventies. And, um, you know, there was kind of an influx of, you know, I'll talk about another dude in a couple minutes, but there was an influx of, uh, South American fighters and specifically a couple of heavyweights and, you know, the popularity or, you know, relative popularity of guys like Oscar Bonavena, for instance, um, and, you know, before him, uh, Goyo Peralta, you know, there were a number of fighters who had, who had become famous often for like fighting Muhammad Ali or for fighting some other slightly more famous fighter or whatever, and, you know, not getting embarrassed or something like that. You know, Manuel Ramos, uh, there were a number of different fighters right around that time who'd come from South America, uh, that were, you know, kind of rose to popularity or whatever. So Bernardo Mercado was one of those guys Tough guy, pretty good punch, uh, not unschooled, but not totally polished either. You know, definitely could get sucked into a brawl, and that's pretty much exactly what we saw against Ernie Shavers because you know he was there to be hit for the most part. Um, but he was a mean fighter. Like he was, he was a guy who was, you know, you had to be careful with him, and also had to be careful if you had him hurt, type of fighter. So yeah, I mean, and he also was. I'm pretty sure he was ranked top ten probably for a few years. For Mercado? Yeah. Well, he was, if he didn't lose the Leon Spinks, uh, what was that, 1980 or so, he probably would have got a title shot at home next. So he was right up there. Yeah, it wasn't exactly like Ali was fucking discerning, you know, with, with yeah. handing out the title shots in the late 70s. You know, there so, were a couple I mean, dudes was, in there. He was right were... there. He was, he was scheduled, or he was definitely in the mix to get a shot at Holmes at one point or another. But then once Spinks beat him, that was kind of the beginning of the end. Well, also, I was going to say uh, something that you mentioned earlier about the 70s and stuff. There were a number of those kind of uh, second and third rate guys because the division was so interesting at the very least, if not really good, like that we've guys we've talked about on other shows, Jeff Merritt, Mac Foster, yeah. you know, and, and those other kind of like guys on the second and third tier who still had a number of really fun fights and slugfest and wars and shit like that because the division was good around that time. Hell yeah, man. It was just stacked with so much talent. You can't, it was, it's pretty incredible. I mean, it definitely is the best era of heavyweight boxing in history. You can't, you can't deny that. Uh, just top to bottom, you know, from the toppest of the top guys all the way to like the lower top 10 and fringe contenders and stuff like that. Just so much talent. And they all made for good fights. Even when the guys tried to step up and fight some of the top guys or whatever it was, there was just constantly in the television era coming up. I mean, you know, it was cool. So what do you got? <laughs> all right so i'm gonna kind of be a little bit lazy and talk <laughs> about a fight that we've probably mentioned on another show and a fight that the people know a lot about anyway but it's still fun to talk about because it's short it's condensed if somebody wants to go look it up they can go watch it in like fucking five minutes and it's still good but you know still talking about it 100 years later too actually 100 and plus years now and that's jack dempsey versus uh <laughs> furpo of course furpo. Bro. <laughs> dempsey furpo it's that good shit um 
we've talked about it before in the context too, where I've mentioned that I think that it's a little bit overrated because it is like, it's, it's very condensed. It's very sloppy, very wild. There's like some knockdowns in there where like, you're not even certain if they're knockdowns, like they're kind of just like grappling and fumbling and pushing and shoving all over the ring, but it's fun. It's definitely a fun fight. Um, and, and it definitely is memorable for being a slug fest because they were both down, you know, very memorably each of them so memorably in fact that there's a famous painting you know depicting jack dempsey's feet up in the air and he's you know outside yeah. the fucking ring george bellows and shit and in any case uh ties in a little bit to what we were talking about like i said um you know luis angel firpo from argentina and yeah you know, when he was a young guy of course back in the late teens and early 20s, there hadn't been a whole heap of South American fighters you know, at all, much less heavyweights. And so, uh, you know, Firpo was a guy who actually worked at a brick factory. And according to the popular legend, he was about to go home from work at this brick factory that he worked at when a couple of guys tried to rob him. And he just straight knocked out three dudes, just was like, bap, 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 and just fucking took care of him, lickety split. His boss at the brick factory was like, holy shit, you can fight. And just basically plunked down money and was like, we're taking you to the gym. We're getting, we're turning into a fighter. And that's exactly what he did. He was able to kind of parlay his strength and his skills into a trip to the U S where it went over very well. And it was actually, uh, he was like highly anticipated, um, they compared his looks to Dempsey, for instance, because he was kind of like, you know, had the slicked back hair, was a handsome looking guy, um, and also had a kind of wild style or whatever. And then when they matched him up with Dempsey, it was highly anticipated, you know, um, and Jack Dempsey, most people know Jack Dempsey's story by now, also kind of a wild fighter who came up in a tough way, I would say, you know, rode the rails and whatnot, uh, had a couple of losses at key moments earlier in his career that forced him to kind of reassess things. Uh, and also kind of, uh, according to him, he fought hungry, like literally hungry. He barely had a fucking thing to eat and didn't get paid shit and was basically working as, you know, like he was working in the fucking mines, but was a fighter, uh, type of thing and had to, go through several CD managers and promoters and whatnot until he finally uh, was able to get with the manager who had money and was able to kind of fund him a little bit better. And he was able to eat more according to him. Of course, you know, there's probably at least some truth to this because you could also see that he was gaining weight as a fighter and blah, blah, blah. So Jack Dempsey is guided to the heavyweight championship, seizes it violently, becomes a hero. But there's also this kind of like tinge of, uh, you know, the undercurrent is that in among the populace, among fans and whatnot, Jack Dempsey on the heels of World War I, he was a slacker. He didn't serve in World War I. Uh, he's not a hero like a number of these other fighters were and, you know, there was tons of loss of life during World War One and blah, blah, blah. So this guy's a big coward and all this type of shit. Our hero's a coward. So it was kind of like a, a very funky situation. Of course, now it's looked at differently because Dempsey's a hero. But he was looked at very strangely at the time. And so it was kind of like he had to keep overperforming in a lot of these fights in order to still maintain the kind of hero status and that's anyway, as much I tried to condense a lot of stuff as much as I could into a short fucking we can do like a three part. We can do like a three part series on Dempsey if we wanted to when his whole life because it is fascinating. Just honestly, one of the most popular sports figures of all time. And when you consider that in the 1920s, there were like, like Doug Jones, Babe Ruth, fuck, I mean, just tons of fucking sports figures that were like massive, huge. And Jack Dempsey was probably the biggest one. You know, it was between him and Babe Ruth, kind of depending on what they were doing on a given day. And I mean, you know, that's crazy. For sure. And, you know, a couple of things about that fight. And like you said, it is a little overplayed because throughout it happened so long ago that what was the exact year? 1923. 23. Yeah. So 1923, that happens. And, you know, as popular as Dempsey was the fight will just grow in lore because of it. You know what I mean? And like, 
And history has a way of just like explaining it on its own instead of like giving you the full view of how the fight went. And I'll give you I'll give you an example of what I mean is that I had a video as a kid that actually the video is on uh, YouTube now, but it was called um, Who is the Fighter of the Century? And these guy, this guy who was putting on a fight show around like 1990 um, hired Bill Caton to get a bunch of historians to do this like black tie dinner thing where they were going to announce who the fighter of the century was. And it was between Jack Denton, like just, you know, the names you can imagine, right? The popular names, because there was no Harry Greb there, even though he should have been in it or others, Henry Armstrong, others like you had um, Jack Johnson. It was all heavyweights except for Sugar Robinson. So that gives you an example. Jack Johnson, Jack Dempsey, Joe Lewis, Rocky Marciano, Robinson, and Ali. Those are the six guys, right? And when they got to the Dempsey part, you know, they're playing the part, like, immediately, like you said, you know, Dempsey fell right into the air, and they start playing big band music behind, you know, the footage and all that, and it's really cool, right? First thing they give you that gives you, like, their own little twist of history, they say Jack Doc Kearns is the most, um, was the most colorful manager in boxing history, and they show him and Dempsey all kind of chummy together, you know, when they had trench coats and stuff, walking out of a building, right? So that gives you the impression that Herms was just a little scoundrel that everybody loved. <laughs> and in fact, he was a piece of shit. So yeah, Dempsey um, sued the shit out of him and won. Yeah. And so um, they move on. They talk about the million dollar gate that Chapantier and he, you know, um, that him and um, George Chapantier have together, which is all true because that is a trivia question throughout history. That's I've had to answer in history books just on tests. Uh, not the like who was the first million dollar gate, but what was first like broadcast over uh the radio, you know what I mean? That type of thing. So you move on. This is what I mean now about the uh the Furpo fight. They show a clip. Oh, Lewis Furpo, the wild bull of Pampas, comes to America to challenge Dempsey. In round one, Furpo's all over Dempsey, and blah blah blah. They don't mention all the knockdowns that Dempsey scores before <laughs> Furpo lands that punch that knocks him through the ropes. They yeah. don't mention that Furpo was knocked around the ring like you know, a bouncing ball for half of that round. He might, I think he scored one knockdown before that like a very glancing one, but they made it seem like Furpo came in rampage again. Dempsey was on the defensive end the whole time. And then Furpo lands a right hand to knock him through the ropes. Then Dempsey rallies to knock him out. And that was the narrative they gave. And I think that's the narrative that's probably been told throughout history too. Like without, and really I, and I gar- I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I guarantee you it's the narrative that has been told to Argentines <laughs> <ever> <laughs> yeah. since, bro, because they get mad. I'm sure. I'm sure. But that's the reality of it is that like, yes, that was one of the most dramatic, and that was probably the most dramatic point up into that point in boxing history that anyone had seen of like a heavyweight champion getting knocked fucking flying through the ropes. You never saw that with Sullivan. You didn't see that with any other champion up into that point. And so, yeah, if it happened with Sullivan, it was because he got so fucking drunk he stumbled through the ropes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, like, um, for you know, for being dramatic, yes, but for being one of the greatest, and it was a wild. I mean, look, they that was a wild fight. It like, was. Football, and, Purple was out of his wits like they are just throwing some wild haymakers left and right. Dempsey, you know, was just a little bit more compact. But people just got to realize, man, it wasn't like, you know, uh, fucking out and out like the greatest, some crazy back alley brawl. Like it was Dempsey beating the shit out of him for most of it and then getting caught with a wild shot at one point and almost losing it all. Yeah, dude. And and on top of that, it's like a it's a literal four minute fight. The fight lasts about four minutes. And even on top of that, they can't show you the full fight. They got to show you like 45 seconds and it's. Whoosh, whoosh. Yep. <laughs> well, that's what oh, they should. Here, here comes Dempsey from around the corner. Yeah. And it's like, bro, can you just show me the fight? It's four minutes. But it, they do kind of, you do get it with that, that narrative attached usually. Yeah. It's true. And then, um, and also too, Ring Magazine in the nineties, they, uh, in, I want to say around 96 or so. They had one of those issues where they ranked the 100 greatest title fights in history. And Dempsey Furpo was like number two. <laughs> I'm actually positive. Dude, I'm, just, I'm, I'm a thousand percent positive Dempsey Furpo was number two. Ali Frazier won. No, Ali Frazier three was number one. Dempsey Furpo was number two. Dude, and you know, uh, and, and I, I'm not trying to throw shade. I'll try to throw it as with as little shade as possible, but I made a list a number of years ago for a website I used to write for. There's like the top 12 heavyweight slugfests. And the list that's up now is not the lists that I, that I made at all. And I specifically was like, I think Dempsey Furpo is overrated and it still got bumped up to number two on my list, even though that's not where I put it. 
And I, but my point is, just overrode you. They're like, well, I actually think it's here. That's literally, that is literally what happened. It's literally what happened. And I, and I was kind of just like, fucking whatever. It's probably better for clicks, but that's not my list. Probably made a conference call. Guys, I'm making an executive decision on Pat's list here. (laughs) And it probably still got more fucking hits than anybody else. Anyway, so fucking, (laughs) but honestly, though, like, seriously, you watch the fight yourself. And I'm just, you can't, it's not, I can think of like 15 fights from the last 15 years yeah. that I would just in terms of action and I would rather watch. It's just not, I mean, it's a great fight. And I think a lot of it is what's on the line and the fact that Dempsey comes real close, you know, but there's a lot of also kind of, like you said, misunderstandings and a lot of kind of misinterpretations and uh misrememberings you know as far as yeah, what that's actually all it is. i mean like it was a wild slugfest for what it was and definitely just didn't, um should be considered in the context of our conversation for all that but it just gets elevated for who dempsey was and by the people like the lore of it just telling that story i remember when dempsey got knocked through the ropes and it, you know one millisecond left and then like it's one of those things you tell your grand got hoisted by the writers they picked him up and they put him yeah, you know, yeah. Like, Dude, all this no. shit and then like Come on. but then like you know it's not good though when everyone takes the narrative and they'd be like well dempsey knocked him down a number of times and then this happened no they just say well purple came out of ball of fire and then dempsey gets hit with a right hand and went through the ropes and the first time the heavyweight champion ever such such sudden indignity in the ring and like dog you know that's not the full story you know yeah. and i mean like purple had a fun like he was one of those guys he's getting inducted into the hall of fame i think this year or he got inducted last year i don't know one of those things for the old timer category and that's the discussion in its own right but um ledger's yeah, pretty thin yeah yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's just you know he, he built his i mean look at that like how many his whole career and his life was built off of that time can't imagine how many times he had to retell that story later on in his life and stuff like oh, that probably yeah. never paid for a fucking drink and ever but you know that's yeah. great but that's not but that's not what we're asking yeah well, yeah, I mean, like, you know, in context of what he did, though, he threw out three of the most um, important heavyweights of that era. He finished off the career of Jess Willard. He almost stopped Jack Dempsey for the heavyweight title. And then near the end of his career, he got stopped by Harry Wills. So. Yeah. And yeah. And the kind of the misrememberings about the fight, too, just briefly, like you said, he got knocked down a number of times himself and mostly tooled around. If you look at the knockdown that yeah. he scores on Dempsey, not exactly the cleanest knockdown looks like more of a push than an actual punch but whatever fine give it to him um and i'm also not certain about when the 20 second rule was was exactly implemented in boxing i really don't know but technically speaking if we're implementing that rule and it's in you know in place then he gets 20 seconds if you're knocked through the ropes and out of the ring not 10 so he would have been fine it so the only controversial aspect of this is anybody i guess holding him up or pushing him or in in any case or in in any way through the ropes which we see happen all the time in fights now except for usually now if somebody's knocked through the ropes like the fight's probably going to be called off it doesn't usually keep going if somebody gets knocked through the ropes these days so in any case um the controversy is a little bit overblown the actual action and the sustained action there's not a whole lot of it it's kind of sloppy but it's fun and especially in terms of like the history behind it and what what was on the line, it's important and it's good to remember. And also Jack Dempsey, in my opinion, is pretty much always fun to talk about because he intertwines with so much history in the 1920s. I mean, yeah. And think about it today, too. There's still so many um, people out there. There's still some people alive that are well, not anyone that remembers Dempsey fighting because that was over 100 years ago. But um, there's... Well, Dempsey died in 1983, right? So, or like mm. 83. So it's Smart like there, yeah. a lot of people obviously were alive when Dempsey was alive. He was a huge figure in New York. I mean, he had his restaurant and everything like that. A well, lot of people remember he was still alive. fighting exhibitions too into the yeah. 1930s. So Absolutely. I mean, it's so, possible I mean, there's some really elderly person out there who saw him. Well, also that too. There's just people that grew up with their grandparents telling them the stories about Dempsey, taking them if they lived in New York or wherever it was to Dempsey's restaurant to meet Dempsey personally, or you know, like a kid totally. that met Marciano or stuff like that. And there's these people are still kicking, they're still around a lot of them, you know. And they're like, man, and so they have this thought of Dempsey still being a, a god among men. And he's always gonna have that type of aura, and he's still considered, I mean, on some lists, he's still placed. I mean, I think like his 
it, the the he still has an aura, but I think it's like dimmed down a little bit. Like, you know, more people are starting to put into context what he actually did as opposed to just like being, no, he was the greatest ever. You can't say anything bad about Dempsey. Like, if you really look at his overall sphere of his, like, you know, the decade that, I mean, the, the town that he was champion, it's a lot of men, you know. But I mean, at the same time, what heavyweight champion was super active back then? Like, not a lot of them, but Dempsey took that to like another extreme. Like, he won years at some points, like, not making a defense. And, Jess Willard did the same thing, but no one gave a shit about Willard. It was just a placeholder when it, when he finally bought Dempsey. But it was like, Dempsey just, once he got into, like, you know, like you said, the glitz and glamour and marrying Estelle Taylor and doing all this other shit, well, boxing was kind of an afterthought to him at that point. And the one the few times that he did fight, there were big occasions, but there was always some weird thing that happened with it. Like, he gets almost stopped against Furpo. He, um, he, uh, what's that? What's that word I'm thinking of? bankrupts an entire town <laughs> or another fight of like all this other shit so i mean you know yeah no shit fucking and then the long count with tunny like who knows man but i'll throw it all though he still remains one of the biggest icons in sports history but i mean yeah yeah absolutely no question um his he's been knocked down some pegs i think and then i think now is as much as i bitch about fans and having to deal with dumb history takes, which is true, like I, I do, but nonetheless, I do think that there are far more people who are aware of boxing history things in general, because there's just greater access to the information. There are overall more people spreading factual things rather than all respect to like Burt Sugar just spreading some, you know, anecdotal story shit with a bunch of untrue rap slapped on top so i mean i think far, far more people are aware but nonetheless still legendary fighter no question yeah totally good call on that one um so i'm gonna fast forward again back into the 90s because <laughs> i was thinking about this fight the other day and trying to put it in context this is actually a, a breakout fight for the winner because this was the first time he was able to prove the critics and naysayers that he can go through some shit in a fight as opposed to just kind of being another British pasty. So that's Lennox Lewis and uh, Ray Mercer. That's a good one. That's a good yeah. one. Hell yeah, that's a good one, dude. And especially because it showcased, uh, you know, one of the things about Ray Mercer that probably the very first thing anybody's gonna bring up is him knocking out tommy morrison fair enough yeah brutal extremely memorable knockout featured in my fucking great white hype great stuff but that dude had an incredible jab like an all-time jab yeah and it was pinpoint too like it wasn't one of those like and it was hard. a shock yeah and hard and accurate and I mean, when you think about it too, like when he fought Klitschko, he was completely washed by the time he fought Klitschko, right? And I think it was just, he got a WBO title shot just because he was still a name. And even though he got beat up and stopped and for the first time in that fight, look at Klitschko's face afterwards. He still he marked still him up, yeah. Him. And that was all because of Mercer's jab. Like, you know, the dude had an accurate jab. And so Mercer at that point, um, by the time the Lewis fight came up, so this was on a, that triple header that HBO put on for... Um, the heavyweight card. So you had Tim with a spoon, Jose, uh, Jose, Jorge Luis Gonzalez, Luis Mercer, and then Holyfield Bobby Chess. And you know, like Witherspoon was on a resurgence, he knocks the shit out of Gonzalez spectacularly, and Holyfield looked so desolate in the fight with Chess that everyone was more fearing for his health than anything out of that. But Lewis came out of that the best one because I mean a lot of people thought Mercer might have got jobbed in that decision. But it also showed Lewis that he could take it. Like, he got beat up in that fight. Like, that was a fight that a lot of people didn't think Lewis was going to be able to take that type of punishment because Mercer put that heat on him. Mercer, at that point, was one of those guys, um, he didn't know what he was going to expect with him. Like, he had potentially comes out the Olympics. He wins the WBO belt when no one gives a shit. But he's one of those dudes that's, like, hot and cold. Like, he looks good. He could be spectacular. But besides his jab, he doesn't do every. He doesn't really do one thing particularly amazing. He has power, but he can just be like lax and just kind of go through the motions sometimes. And he, you know, and he was kind of one-dimensional. Even though he was a gold medalist in the Olympics, he could be one-dimensional. Like he um Larry Holmes made him look foolish when his first loss when he got outboxed. Tommy Morrison was beating the shit out of him. 
Francisco Damiani was out boxing him pretty compreh- comprehensively before he mm-hmm. got his splattered. And um, you know, Burt Cooper in an inspired performance put some beat about put some heat on him. Jesse, so, Jesse Curtis. Well, that's what I was getting to too. And the thing that really became a turning point for, for Mercer <laughs> and put his career in a tailspin was that uh on the undercard, I don't I don't remember what I don't remember the main event of the show. Yeah, it was. Oh, it was I, some, I, know, I know what it was. It was Bo. It was Bo Dokes. I think it was Bo Dokes. Yeah, it was Rick some co made of some something. Yeah, yeah. It was Riddick Bo Michael Dokes, and um, it wasn't aired by HBO, but you know they aired it anyways. I think the show highlights because Mercer was supposed to be the next title challenger, and instead he put on a performance so flat in that fight, looked like shit. Ferguson, despite his bad record, was a guy that you couldn't come in bad shape against. Like he could out hustle you, and he was out boxing him. And then what became even more so, after Mercer loses a listless decision in a big upset, controversy arises after the fight because it comes <laughs> out that if you watch the fight, there's a lot of talking going on, mostly by Mercer. You see him talking a lot to Ferguson. And most people would just write that off the trash talking. You know what I mean? You know, he's just talking shit to him, trying to break him out of his game, whatever. According to Ferguson and others after that fight, that wasn't the case at all. Mercer was trying to give him a bribe. Yeah. Mercer, <laughs> Mercer was telling him, nah, man, I don't have it tonight. I just don't know. One hundred thousand dollars. That's your cup. All right. You drop for a hundred K. I'll you know drop right now and you good. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ferguson apparently replied, "Well, you should have trained, Ray. You should have trained." And, which um, is which is wild too because that shit that shit blew. Uh, I think it was like a five million dollar payday for Ray Mercer yeah. against Riddick Bow. Absolutely, and he got in hot water for that shit. Dude. Yeah, Riddick, yeah, you know, and he, he got taken to court. court. Yep, he got yeah. indicted for fucking. He got indicted Robert. for bright for attempted bribery during a motherfucking fight, yeah. and he, he wound up like nothing came of it. Like he wound up getting the charges got dropped, and like nothing came of it. But like, sure. but still, like that shit was highly publicized. It was embarrassing, you know. And it basically it derailed his career for a bit, for sure. It really did. And Ferguson was the one that got that title shot against Bo instead, and got absolutely blown away. But whatever. Um, hey, so yeah, that's Ferguson- fucking. That's how that shit rolls. You know what I'm saying? Coming so in shape, career, then I don't know. Mercer's career was kind of in a tailspin at that point. Let me let me look up uh, on Boxrec really quick. Hold on. If he yeah, had any... subscribe to Boxrec, by the way, one dollar oh, yeah, a month. Plus. Everybody, excuse me, Boxrec Plus. That's right. <laughs> I got that Boxrec Plus too. I'm not gonna well, lie, man. I haven't used any of the wild features, but I just I just look at records. That's that's all I need it for. The only thing I wish it had, to be honest, was that like. If it, if it had a feature where you could do like fantasy fights for all time with anybody instead of just doing current fighters, like yeah. I, if I if I want to match Carlos Monzon with I don't know and one of the current guys today or something like that, like I wish I could do something like that as opposed to just has to be they have to be active and they have to be in the same division thing. I mean the analytics must be crazy for it, but whatever. That's what I'm saying is that that'd be a lot of data input. Sure, sure. So after he loses to Ferguson, that was '93. He beats Mark Wills, Tony Wills, and Jesse Ferguson in a rematch, which he looks like shit in. And right before the Mer- and right before um and then he fights Marion Wilson. Uh yeah. Then he fights Marion Wilson, longtime journeyman who went the distance with everybody, scores a draw with him. That's not a good look for him. So the fact that you're fighting a split decision with Jesse Ferguson and fighting a draw with Marion Wilson immediately after that is, well, bad. Yeah, and so no, not ideal at all. So he fights Evander Holyfield after that fight. And that's what Mercer's career was at that point. When you think about it, is that the Holyfield people, this was Holyfield's comeback after retiring. You know, Holyfield had that heart ailment or whatever it was after he loses to Michael Moore and he's forced to retire and no one really knows what's happening. Holyfield claims he gets healed. And when he comes back, they feel Mercer is a safe enough opponent for a Holyfield comeback with enough of a, with enough of a name, which is interesting. And so um, Holyfield... You know, it was a good fight, though. But Mercer showed it. And that's the thing I think that got Mercer the Lewis fight, probably, is because Mercer didn't look like shit in that fight. He came in inspired. He lost, definitely. It was the first time he got dropped. But he gave Holyfield a hell of a fight. And he gave Holyfield rounds. Yeah, he, like he had to get, like, pummeled to get dropped, too. Yeah. But he gave Holyfield a hell of a fight. Like, he definitely gave him rounds. And it was not an easy win for Holyfield. Like, he had to go through some, you know, some rough patches to win that. So that was enough. That the Lewis people, after he lost to Oliver McCall and he had come back with a couple of comeback wins off of television, I don't even think they were in America, um, they felt that he was worthy enough to fight uh, Lewis at, at Madison Square Garden. Yeah, dude, he had just fought fucking Justin Fortune. Yeah. Who, who I does Justin Fortune still work a wild card? I know he did for a long ass time, but 
in any case, I know he, uh, you know, was working at a wild card for a while and, and et cetera, et cetera. Butler. What's that? And he beat Butler too, Lionel Butler, didn't he? Yeah, Lionel Butler, Justin Fortune, and then he destroyed Tommy Morrison, That's who was, okay. you know, obviously at the end of his viability as a fighter for the most part. Sure. You know, he, was, he had already been beaten up a few times and lost twice, drawed once. I hate to so. say it probably already had AIDS at that point. He probably, yeah, because it wasn't that long after that that it was, uh, that it, it, fuck, was it even before? No, what? That might have been. Well, I don't want to get derailed, but it might have (laughs) even been, I might have fucking even been before that because I vaguely (laughs) remember Lennox Lewis having to say some shit about it. But in any case, um, whenever it was, yeah, Lennox Lewis was obviously, uh, after the loss to McCall, which was, It wasn't so much controversial, but it was kind of shocking. McCall was definitely seen as not somebody who was supposed to take out a Lennox Lewis. He was definitely supposed to seen as somebody Lewis was supposed to walk over. But Lewis, uh, one of the main kind of threads in his career was that he was constantly whining. (laughs) And I liked Lewis, by the way. I, I was a fan. But he was constantly whining about how the American public didn't like him. He was constantly like feeling like he needed to prove himself, which he kind of did. But at the to be fair, he kind of also did prove himself several times and just kind of never got accepted. And then he retired and everybody was like, wait, no, don't go. And he was like, fuck you fucking guys, fucking dicks. Yeah. And rightly so. But this was during that time where especially after that loss to Oliver McCall, he was just like, fuck, you know, like I'm. I had just spent so much time trying to endear myself to the American public and break into that kind of market because that's where all the great heavyweights are right now. And I just got washed by this fucking guy. So he was on the comeback, like you were saying, uh, defeats Lionel Butler, Justin Fortune. Uh, Tommy Morrison is just enough of a name still and just viable enough still that people are thinking, oh, if he's destroying Tommy Morrison, you know, then he's obviously he's feeling better. He's doing all right. He's come back from that knockout loss or whatever. And Ray Morrison, like, or I'm sorry, Ray Mer- Mercer, like you said, is at a point in his career where he's seen more as an opponent than anything. Whereas a couple of years before that, he was an obvious, uh, obvious top contender. And on top of that, uh, an extra little kind of thing for this fight is that Lennox Lewis was in the 1988 Olympics. So was Ray Mercer. Ray Mercer was the captain of the, I think at least briefly, the captain of the U.S. team and was also seen as a a top, uh, especially coming out of the amateurs, a top heavyweight, but just like you said earlier, inconsistent. Just could not be dependent on and sounded like you didn't really like to train. Well, yeah, you didn't, you just didn't know what you were going to get. I mean, the fact that you have a, it was almost seemed like when he lost to Ferguson that he felt like, okay, the payday's lined up. This is just a layup for him. He didn't have to do anything to earn that. And you can't do that type of shit. And that's exactly why he came in and got caught out hustled. And so I think that humbled him enough when the fact that his stock dropped so much from that and that he was going on a slump. Well, you know, he was, like you said, he scored a couple of wins, but they're over journeyman opponents. And then he scores a draw with Marion Wilson, which is really inexcusable in itself. And yeah, he fights Holyfield, he loses, but I mean, you know, he gives Holyfield a good fight, but like you said, now he's looked upon as opponent because he still lost that fight, and he got dropped in it for the first time. So the Lewis people are looking at him as being like, okay, he's clearly going to give us rounds. I'm sure Emmanuel Stewart had a big part in picking Ray Mercer as well, because he probably saw him as like safe enough to get a good win, but he knew that he was going to get like a good fight out of it too. And I don't think anyone anticipated Mercer was going to give him that good of a fight. Like... Mercer, like you said, had one of the great jabs, and he out-jabbed Lewis that fight. Lewis has a great jab, but Mercer out-jabbed him. Mercer was, like, physically stronger than Lewis and was able to, like, push him back. And, I mean, Lewis was forced to fight. Like, that was the first time Lewis was really forced to be like, all right, I got to, like, dig in here and, like, rip some uppercuts and some shit on this dude because, like, Mm -hmm. otherwise he's going to walk all over me. You know, he can't just sit back and jab and kind of clinch a little bit and try to outbox him like he did with Morrison. Like, I mean, you know, he was forceful with Morrison, but, like, he... He, had, he could fight at his own pace during that fight because he could do what he wanted. Mercer was forcing him to fucking fight that night. Yeah. And Mercer, to his credit, like, just was chugging all night long. Like, it was just a really a bruising, brutal fight. Yeah. Lennox even hurt him in two different rounds. Like, kind of wobbled him a little bit. But he was also, like, he was loading yeah. up. Like, he was, like, he had really to, yeah. chucking. And, and, I mean, Lennox can fucking punch, too. Like, that dude could really throw. 
it was before it was toward the the beginning of um his tr- trainer relationship with Emmanuel Stewart. So he was still kind of learning, I think, to kind of yeah. like tighten his technique a little bit. And his right hand wasn't quite what it was a couple years later, in my opinion. But still, the dude could fucking punch. He could always punch. He always had that kind of lanky, tall, gangly guy power. Um, mm-hmm. And he, he hurt Mercer. But what a lot of people remember is that by the end of the fight, Lennox's face is pretty swollen. You know, he's got out jabbed clearly. And not just like, you know, peck, peck, peck jab, but slam, slam, yeah. you know, fucking shit was brutal so um i mean i don't have an yeah. issue with yeah. lewis winning the fight because he definitely i think outfought mercer but that jab was a son of a bitch absolutely and if you look at the scorecards lewis wins by two points on one card at one point by the other it was even on the third so like that was a close close really well, somebody's fight. gonna be like why didn't they rematch you know why Lennox yeah. didn't want that fight again. <laughs> if he didn't, he too, then why would he? Yeah, Lewis had bigger fresh to fry. The fact that he beat Mercer and that he was moving on at this point, I think he became Tyson's mandatory after that. There was no goddamn way he was going to go fight Mercer in a rematch when he was going to sit in that position to get a chance to get the, you know, Tyson in a rematch or Tyson, not for that matter. And, um, or just risk his number one contendership because <laughs> Tyson was going to get stripped eventually for not fighting him and then fight Oliver McCall or somebody, which he ended up doing. But for Mercer, you know, that, the fact that he put on such an inspired performance in that fight and almost beat Lewis gave him another slot against, you know, the guy that fought on uh, the fight right before him, Tim Witherspoon. And those two put on an absolute bruising affair um, soon after that. And I love that fight. That's one of my favorite heavyweight fights of the 90s. You know what I mean? That's just straight up two guys walking right in there. And it's like good boxing. It's not just completely like slugging without blocking anything. Like, uh, Witherspoon had that, you know, shell defense that he would kind of walk into and stuff like that. And Mercer still had that bruising jab. And those two just beat the shit out of each other. Walked into the center of the ring and just took turns laying it in. And if you watch it at one point, because Witherspoon with that chopping overhand right that he's obliterated so many people with, he hits Mercer with it a few times. And at one point, he hits Mercer with a massive one. And Mercer kind of skids across the ring and you hear Larry Merchant, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Two yeah. un- two underperforming inconsistent heavyweights who could have gone a lot farther. Yeah, absolutely. Putting on an absolute showcase that day. And I thought Witherspoon might have edged that fight. But it was almost like the judge, you know, judge was like, yeah, let's give Mercer this one. And we've been kind of jobbing in the past few times, you know what I mean? But yeah. And Mercer's a great dude. If you ever have a chance to meet him, it goes for anybody. Like if you ever have a chance to meet him, just hang out with a guy. He's just a fucking joy. Absolute joy to be around. Super nice. Really still has his wits about him in great shape, and he's hilarious. Like, and he loves to talk about his fights and just be around fans, you know. Well, he he kind of started a little bit later as a pro too, and he uh, I'm pretty sure I want to say he was an all army champion. Yeah. Pretty sure he was. Yeah, he was. Yep. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, like, so he kind of got his start as as in the Olympics, and then as a pro a little bit later than usual. But I mean, so kind of maybe. And he's fair. a smoker. <laughs> from what i heard it's my kind of guy my kind of guy yeah no, he's he seems like a cool as fuck guy dude and that is an underrated fight too uh, a lot of people just co- talk about it in the context or like oh, mercer beat his ass it was a lot closer than you think it was a good fight what mercer witherspoon or no i was lennox oh. lewis ray mercer oh yeah that was a really close fight like i can understand mercer having a grievance thinking he kind of he kind of earned it or whatever but I, I should go back and watch that. It's been a few years since I've seen it, but it was just one of those fights that I fondly remember from back then because it was awesome. And I don't think anyone, people were hoping that it would be competitive and that Mercer would show up and like, you know, put it on him. But I don't think anyone can, uh, was expecting it to be like that. So. Yeah, dude, it was, uh, it was a good fight. I th- yeah. I'll probably go back and rewatch that shit, but another rewatchable fight from a couple years earlier, technically the eighties, even though it was the end of the eighties, but we'll, skid back a few years before then also a whole lot of fun had some history attached to it some big stakes of course and almost got totally derailed uh you'll as soon as i mentioned this you're gonna be like yay vander holyfield michael dokes a lot of fun the context matters too and the context was that it uh, the stakes just almost could not be higher michael dokes was right there he was right there so close. You know, Dokes 
is I've said it before, like out of the whole lost generation, he might have been the biggest waste of talent. Like when it really comes down to it. Like it's I mean, it's debatable, and I hate to say like wait, like a complete waste of talent, but that's what it really was. That guy, who knows what what else he could have accomplished. Like his skill set was incredible back then, like the fastest hands you could have imagined since like the days of Ali. He knew how to put combinations together, absolute elite amateur, and he had good power, and he was just a really fast, well swooled boxer. Like he he was fun to watch back then, you know what I mean? And had a great fro. Yeah, yeah. And a dude that Shit. just come on. Throw flowers out to the ring, like you know, to the to the ladies in the audience have that big smile. But I mean, what I mean by waste, like, yeah, he was another product of the Don King curse where everyone was living under that umbrella and he was using them as pawns, but he as opposed to all those other heavyweights, took that drug use and everything to like another level that you couldn't even imagine. You know what I mean? Like it was squandering. It was bad. It was we really... have a whole show just about the stories that people have told about him. Yes. It's, it's crazy. You know, the wildest one is that the FBI broke down his doors for an, inv- for an investigation because they thought he, they were, tra- it was like, they were breaking out a trafficking ring in their house because so much cocaine was moving in and out of it and when they walked in they thought they were going to get some frank lucas type shit or something like that right instead they found dokes there by themselves and they're like wait what and he was like yeah that's just my personal use <laughs> that's how much cocaine he was using <laughs> they're like bro you need some help like that's how much coke they were using they really broke down the ball like they were getting all these tips and they're breaking all these things thinking they were going to do some massive like breakdown of like a whole drug ring and it's just poor mike and it's just michael dokes by himself for his own personal use that's a lot of fuck coke. That's a lot of cocaine, like a lot of cocaine. But <laughs> so by the he had a complete crash out, you know, after he lost the bell to um Jerry uh, Harry Coxia and was it 82? <coughs> 82 or 83? Oh, gosh, I have to double check on the yeah, so yeah, 83, 83. So he loses it in, to, to Harry Coxia in 83. Dude is like completely wigged out on cocaine while he loses that fight, too. Um, and his career, you know, skidded off for a minute. Absolutely skidded off. He had a few fights. He tried to make a couple of abortion, <laughs> comments, but like nothing really came of it. You know, like he um he had a weird rematch with Tex Cobb, which I think was like a technical decision win, and scored a couple of knockouts here and there. But like it was mostly marred by inactivity because he was always in and out of jail for drug offenses and other various things. It wasn't until around like uh, I have to look at his record again. Probably wasn't around till like, you know, was it 86, 87, where, well, 87, I would say, where he started to make a comeback and start putting things together and actually like, try to clean himself up for a minute, no? Yeah, it seemed like he kind of got a, you know, new lease on life or whatever, yeah. Yeah, so I was, I was right. So, like, he had a couple of fights here and there. His last fight was in 85 when that weird fight with Cobb. And then he comes back in 87. The end of 87, and then he scores a series of wins up until the Holyfield fight. But he was, like, impressive in these wins, too. Like, they weren't, you know, they were, they, these guys that he was fighting at this point, like Ken Lacusta was Evander Holyfield's sparring partner and, you know, was an overall journeyman. Um, James Pritchard, I think, didn't he fight for a cruiserweight belt? Wasn't he, like, the quickest guy? And then he got knocked out, like, the quickest or some shit. Like in twenty four, oh, yeah. Like in and none of them were very big heavyweights either. Some yeah, of them were yeah, guys yeah, who had moved yeah. up or like whose best years were you know, a couple exactly. of years back there. But by the time he fought Holyfield in the beginning of nineteen eighty nine, I mean that was at the pinnacle. Like he built himself back up. That was as close as you were going to get to like the original former dopes. And he was clean for the most part. He was motivated. And Holyfield, at this point, has he had you know undisputed cruiserweight champion moving up to heavyweight. He was on the fast track to, you know, being moved toward a, a potential fight with Mike Tyson, but at the same time, didn't look absolutely invincible in all of his fights at this point either. At heavyweight. Yeah, he had uh the transition was kind of rough. And also there was a lot a lot of people might not remember if they weren't around then or just haven't seen, you know, the the writing about Holyfield at the time. Um but that's not to say that people didn't like him or anything like that. But a lot of people have to remember that it, he was part of a very successful Olympic team, but he was viewed as kind of like a, a not definitely not a failure. I don't want to word it like that, but he almost like an underachiever on the team because a lot, a little bit more was expected and he got jobbed. 
against Kevin Barry in that fight where he landed a late punch and was disqualified. Yeah. Um, and so, he, I mean, he got totally jobbed. There's absolutely no question. But uh, considering how successful, how immediately successful some of the other fighters on that team were, you know, he kind of went under the radar a little bit. Then on top of that, even though he was fast tracked as a cruiserweight, you know, he, he went to war with Kawi. You know, like that was a very tough fight. He had a couple of other tough fights at cruiserweight where, you know, not that he didn't look good, but he had to, he had to kind of go through it a little bit. And so I think that um, the overall feeling was that like, there's no way he's going to be able to move to heavyweight. He's probably got a short shelf life. He's not a big guy. You know, yeah, he's got a lot of heart, but he's not a massive puncher. Where is he going to go? That kind of thing. And then on top of that, he moves to heavyweight. He has a couple struggles there, too. He's still, he's not p- packing on a ton of weight yet. He probably hadn't fucking started the roids. And so, you know, like he's, he's honestly, like he looks pretty normal still. He looks like he looks like a cruiserweight moving to heavyweight. Yeah. That's what he kind of looks like at this point. But the, right around this time is when that starts to change. But he he didn't look super successful yet. No, I mean, like, and he was beating at this point. He's beating like, um, you know, the retreads, right? Like he knocks out, he beats Quick Tillis, who at this point is like, you know, at, definitely labeled as a yeah, journey from a different era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gatekeeper journeyman at this point. Um, he stops Pinklin Thomas, <laughs> who was in the thoroughs of his drug, you know, and drugs and stuff like that, and you know, near the tail end of his career. Um, what was it, Seamus McDonough? He beats. And I mean, that guy was just, he gives a shit. And so like, at that point, then when he fights Dokes, this is like a significant fight. Cause I mean, you know, but that's still, it's not, it's another one though, that Holyfield is expected to win and he's expected to win impressively. But again, I don't know how many people expected Dokes to come in and fight the way he did because Dokes for the first time in his career, even when he was, you know, champion and like early on, like really put himself through the ringer and got himself into the best possible shape he could have got himself into because he labeled himself this fight as do or die. Holyfield might not, might not have done it. Like I know Holyfield is not the one of those type of guys that ever like took anything lightly. And, you know, the way he came into the ring reflected that. But I don't think he had the same <laughs> that Tillis did where he was like, this is do not Tillis, um, that Dopes did where he was like, this is do or die for me. Like if I don't win this, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, I need this, you know? And he came in then with that mentality, got himself into the best possible shape he could have got himself into and took Holyfield to hell and back. I mean, there aren't a whole lot of fights, especially at heavyweight like that and at that level. Yeah. where like, dude, you know, Dokes was not just some stupid ass brawler or something like that. Dude had skill. He knew what he was doing in there and he could punch. And same with Holyfield, not some dumbass brawler or something like that. But there's not a whole lot of times like at heavyweight at that level with two fighters on that level just going and they're just like, let's fucking chuck them. Yeah. Let's oh, just, yeah. just stand there and let's do this. And that's what they did for like the first like two and a half rounds. Just bam, 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 bam. And Dokes, you know, because of all the stuff he put his body through and all that, his legs weren't moving the way they used to. Like, he didn't have the same spring in him, right? Or the same type of head movement. But he still had the fast hands. He still had the fucking flurious combinations. He still had power. And he knew how to put that shit together. And Holyfield, like like you said, Holyfield's a great boxer, but he's a guy that's never been, like, Mr. Defensive Wizard. Like, you can touch him. And Holyfield was, like, getting in there in the pocket with Dokes, and Dokes was able to get off because he was, like, comfortable there being able to land that. Dokes is a vicious, was a vicious body puncher, knew how to land that hook to the body with, like, ripping uppercuts to the head and other hooks and stuff like that. Had a good jab and just could flurry. He had faster hands than Holyfield did. And he was using that to his advantage. There are pockets where he would just rip some shots down. Beautiful. Because, you know, Dokes was a yeller. And, like, he would land them. And Holyfield, you know, was looking visibly, like, shook and shocked and, like, there were many times Holyfield said after that fight too that he had to go through so much pain and everything, and he questioned himself as a fighter and a man. If he you was can able see to do him that. doing it during the fight, like there's a couple times where he takes a couple shots and it's almost like he has to step back and take a big breath, like, yeah, like I didn't expect this. Holy shit, you know what I'm saying? Like there were a couple of times where he did that, and that was well, Holyfield that showed that, like you said in the in the first Cowie fight that he had to like go through some fire and shit to get through it. So he already knew his heart was legit, but this was his first time at heavyweight really going through something like that. And he had to take it to another level. And then to his credit, he did. He just kept on surging. And Dokes, you know, for everything he put himself, his body through and all the limits that he, that, that he brought himself to get to this point, he just couldn't, you know, his body couldn't keep up with it. Like, you got to take yourself to a certain peak in Holyfield, which makes him an all-time great. 
and puts him above other people, you know, in terms of history is that like when he had to, and he had to take it to another level, even one that didn't seem possible, he would still be able to pull, push himself to that point. And Dokes wasn't able to keep up with him at that point. And that's how Dokes started withering near the end. Each round, you know, it was so vicious and tough and tough. But eventually, Holyfield started breaking through. And once he finally broke through, Dokes just completely fell apart. And as he got stopped, I mean, it was a vicious stoppage. Like, Dokes wasn't completely unconscious or nothing like that. This wasn't like, you know, when Razor Ruddock got to him a couple of years, uh, a year later. But, um... This was, it was, you know, it was nasty. Like, Holyfield got him on the ropes, just laid him out right there. Dokes started faltering, and Holyfield had to be pulled off. Like, you saw it. He was, you know, he kept on going. Like, he was like, nah, I'm going to kill this motherfucker. Like, I'm not Yeah, gonna like, you, you fucking, <laughs> you put me through that shit? I'm going to put yeah. you through that shit. That like, was almost like on, how it was, yeah. Yeah, he just kept on going and going, but it was finally over. And you were just going to, you know, the the going to take away from that i feel like for people my, what probably was probably like because listen i wasn't a boxing fan back in 1989 and i don't think you were either so like but the takeaway i've gotten from it over the years reading about it is that yeah it was impressive that holyfield went through something like that but two he had to go through something like that with michael dokes so the people were just kind of like eh, you know exactly yep. yeah yeah <laughs> Well, and that's that's that kind of like double edged sword when it comes to those kinds of performances. You know what I'm saying? Where like you're like, is is this the kind of thing where like uh you're kind of disappointed or you're concerned because like you don't really you're concerned about who they went through it against, but you're kind of impressed, but because they went through it and they came out on the right end. You know what I'm saying? Like it's and that's where you have to figure it out. And that's the, that's the tough part of being a manager or a matchmaker is figuring out where the fighter is on that kind of, you know, scale or whatever. And so that's kind of where it was with Holyfield. And um, fortunately for him, like you said, he still had those gear, that gear or those extra gears against other fighters too, and showed it. And so this was kind of a preview of that, but it did, it was shaky. And on top of that, Dokes was, he came pretty damn close. He came pretty damn yeah. close. He hurt Holyfield pretty good. He even rallied late too. It was like round seven or eight. He still had a good rally. Oh yeah, yeah. He did have one more little last rally in him, and it's it, it stinks to because like Dokes, you can tell he wanted that so badly, and like he pulled himself out of the shambles. You always got to give credit to somebody that can pull themselves out of their fucking worst in their life to to at least you know bring themselves back to that point. And that was the end of him. That really was in terms of him being anything relevant. That was the end. I mean, he got popularity back in his name. Um, there was discussion of him still fighting Tyson even after that fight. But, you know, nothing nothing came of it. His last, like, he fights Razor Ruddick, almost oh. dies in the ring. Like, that's one of the most vicious, brutal knockouts in Arthur history. Arthur Mercanti Jr. almost absolutely gets him killed. Mm, well, that was, you know... Uh, Among uh, other fighters, but, you a know. Course, a course that he would take throughout his career afterwards, right? Um, dude, such an absolute. What remember that time? Memories. Remember that time he got hit with a punch during the round, then went to the corner and took their water bottle and took a swig out of it. <laughs> like he's somebody now. Like no, the, like the corner that he got now. punched by, he walked over. The guy was gonna. He took their water. He's like, yo, give me that. He took a swig. and went back to. I mean, but I would have punched his ass again. <laughs> Fucking my water. But he um, so he almost gets killed against uh Razor Ruddick. And somehow, I don't understand this up until this day because I've tried to understand it and I've like studied Dokes' career extensively enough to see how, why, any reason why he can get a title shot against Riddick Bowe. But I still don't understand it. But somehow he got a title shot again at Riddick Bowe in, what was that, like 93 or so. And if you thought Dokes was shot, like he wasn't even the same guy that was even close to the Holyfield fight at that point or even the fucking uh, um, Razor Ruddick fight. Like, this was a spell, you know, completely spent shell casing that had no business being in a heavyweight title fight. And, um, yeah, he got blasted out in, like, a couple of minutes in the first round. Called Larry Merchant a jackass after the fight. And then rode off into the sunset. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I guess it wasn't necessarily a surprise that he passed away about 10, 12 years ago. I mean, I'm not, I'm not it's not good. I'm not happy yeah. that it happened. But dude lived a fast life. The dude lived... He lived. And it was a really, I mean, it was a tough one too. Like he wasn't a good person outside the ring. I'll never try to condemn him for that. He almost killed his ex-girlfriend or ex-fiance or whatever, beat her half to death and you know, and raped her and stuff. And then he had to go to jail for a number of years for that heinous crime. 
And um, yeah, when he got out, I think he just made the, I don't know what he was doing after that, but I think he lived a kind of quiet life and then died of a uh, liver cancer or something. But yeah, good call though for that fight, because I mean, you know, that in my opinion, that is the best heavyweight fight of the eighties. Like it just, it is what it is, you know? And there were good fights from that era when we were just talking about a couple of them and I'm about to bring up uh, another one, I think from that year, but um, they were just like, you know, it was just one of those times. Like that was that was, that's a pretty definitive way. You wait until nineteen eighty nine, the end of the decade, before you produce their best fight of the decade. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like there's there's some other good fights of the decade, or other great fights of the decade too. But like, not a whole lot of great heavyweight fights from the decade, though. In my in my opinion, like I mean, at least not on that level, not on the upper level. So let's see. I just want to make sure I got my years right with this one. Okay, thanks, Boxer. It was... well, and with the checking of the box rec plus, I was about to say earlier too. I don't even use any of the crazy features, but I use box rec so fucking much, yeah, yeah, literally yeah. daily, that I felt just like I felt like I should. Like there's and I use it for free, mm -hmm. like a dollar a month. And then on top of that, to also support our boy Gray Johnson. Of course. I mean, dude, like it's a no brainer. I'm just saying, I'm not getting paid by them to say this. I'm just saying, y'all. So we're going back again to 1979 really quick. And a lot of people kind of forget about this or forget about the end of his career because they always just associate the Jerry Cooney fight with it. Because it was that vicious. I get it. When you think about the end of Ken Norton's career, that's what I'm getting to. You always think, well, he almost got murdered against Jerry Cooney. Yes. But before that fight, he had two absolute bangers who no one ever really talks about today. And that was against Scott Ledoux and Tex Cobb. Oh, man. And if you go back on those fights, Norton is just washed enough that he makes those fucking wars and they are awesome. <laughs> and kind of like how we were just talking about, too. Like, it's like not a good thing that you're going to war with, yeah. like, you know, it's not a good thing that you're going to war with Tex Cobb. You know, it's not a good thing. Or that you're Scott going... Ledoux. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially, with all due respect, especially Scott Ledoux. Uh, but like, I could, but that's, we talk about that before too, or with other fights as well, where like sometimes the diminished version of these fighters makes for better fights. Sure. And the Scott Ledoux fight, that, that one's dramatic as shit. Like it takes place in blooming, uh, in blooming field, Minnesota, Ledoux's hometown or, or, you know, home state, whatever. Cause like Ledoux was huge in Minnesota. Everybody loved him out there. Hard work and blue collar guy, you know, kind of that rocky story, whatever. Can make some outlandish comments that make you raise an eyebrow or two, especially before the Holmes fight. But um, tough as nails, dude. You can't give him. You, you got to give him that. Like the dude literally fought everybody back then. Did not give a shit. Lost more than he won against those guys, but always made for fun fights and always gave his best. Like he just very limited. But I mean, you know, you got to give him respect. And when he was a, when he was an analyst. For Friday night fights or Tuesday night fights, whatever it was, the ESPN time in the in the early 2000s, there was one time Butterbean tried needling him after a fight, talking about his nose or making fun of him a little bit. And Ledoux, Ledoux got really like aggravated by that comment. And he was like, he was like, yeah, well, I fought, you know, 14 world champions or blah, 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 or 12. Like, I forgot the amount that he said, but it was a substantial number. And he was like, Butterbean fought Willie Get Up or so and so. This one. <laughs> like, he got really pissed off about that. <laughs> but, yeah, um, I, he said Willie Get Up. And um, I think that was when he said Willie Get Up and Willie Fall Down or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> he yeah, said he some shit like that. that. And rightfully so, man. I ain't going to have Butterbean cracking on you, but... um. You know, won. I respect Butterbean or whatever, but there's a reason why you were scheduled past four rounds like twice out of like 55 fights, sure. homie. I'm just saying. Um, But the Ledoux fight is awesome. Like, Ledoux's getting out boxed for most of it. Norton was one of those guys that like, he was not the classic boxer. He fought out that weird crab shell defense and everything like that, but he could pick apart most guys. And, you know, he's one of the top fighters of that of that decade. Um. <laughs> So even diminished Norton is still able to like piece up a slow ag guy like we do, but we do put on a lot of pressure on him, keeps on putting on pressure, is touching Norton because Norton is this is 1979 after being KO'd by Ernie Shavers Norton. So like clearly he's on the back end. And eventually Norton starts withering. 
as you know, as he tended to do sometimes. Ledoux keeps on pushing on, pushing it on. And then by the end of it, though, what gets awesome is that like Ledoux finally scores a knockdown. I think it was around like round nine, around 10, like drops the shit out of Norton. Norton's completely exhausted at this point. And it looks like it's gonna, you know, it looks like a massive upset's about to happen. And then around 10, Ledoux drops him again. And Norton is out, and it looks like the referee stops the fight at this point. That's when all the confusion reigns and everyone's going crazy because Ledoux turns around, waves his hand in the air. Uh, the crowd is going absolutely insane. And then the referee is trying to like, like trying to be like, no, 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 I didn't stop and I didn't stop. And Norton is just done in the corner. It probably should have been stopped. And no, nah, they end up going to score cards. <laughs> yeah, Norton was pretty much lucky to make his way through that fight. But I mean, also, like you said, he had been stopped uh, three times already, and he was a guy who didn't really, like, he, generally speaking, didn't come back from, like, getting hurt badly real well. Like, and and granted, yeah. it was against, like, punchers, too. Like, it wasn't like they were nobodies or something, but still, he didn't take it super great, and so he got, like, destroyed. Oh, it was bad. And then, like, in this fight, um, even in the book, the, the book in the corner, mm -hmm. the one that interviewed all the trainers... Norton's trainer, Bill Slayton, is one of the guys that was interviewed in it. And when he brought up the uh, the Shavers fight, he was like, eh, Kenny just got caught. He never liked big punchers, was always spooked of him. Even sparring, he didn't like sparring big punchers. <laughs> and then he just went on to the next thing. So it's kind of like, you know, Norton was never that type of dude. So the fact that he fought Cooney near the end is very curious. But um, uh, yeah, after he fights Ledoux, almost loses that <laughs> fight. That should have been the end of it right there. You go on fighting at a draw with Scott Ledoux, where you should have lost probably should give you all the indication that you need that you shouldn't be fighting anymore. But in his very next fight, he fights Tex Cobb. Tex Cobb was coming off of the um, Ernie Shavers win. So he's riding high, and he's thinking he might put another, you know, scalp of the late 70s, of another 70s contender on his resume. So, <clears throat> but Norton, um, to his credit, was able to put it together. And another, that was an absolute slugfest too. I mean, Cobb was landing a lot of punches. Norton's washed up, but he still has enough skill left, and he's much more skillful than Ernie Shavers chugging the long ass than was, that he was able to outbox um, Cobb for periods of time to uh, to get a decision out of it. But the fight was so good that people would throw money into the ring afterwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and it was, like I was saying a minute ago, too, like a diminished version of fighters. Like, Norton's not moving yeah. as well. His, de his defense isn't quite as good, but he could still punch a bit, and you know, Tex Cobb, he ain't going anywhere. You could just punch the absolute shit out of him and he's generally not going to go anywhere. Same thing happens against Norton, except for Norton hands him his very first pro loss because Tex Cobb and his team apparently just miscalculated, I guess, as far as what Norton would be able to, you know, bring into the ring and thought he was more done than he actually was. He was done too. It's just that Tex Cobb was so, so basic and would just follow dudes around a little too much. And then it's interesting too, because... Norton and Cooney were both commentators for Cobb Shapers. And then mm -hmm. Norton fights Cobb immediately after that. And then, you know, soon enough fights Cooney as well. And I believe Cooney was um, no, Cooney was originally supposed to fight Shapers on that card, not Cobb. And I think Cooney either suffered a hand and he suffered some type of injury. And I remember during the uh, the broadcast of it, Cooney's doing commentary. And he was like, yeah, I was hoping they were going to postpone the whole card and wait for me to heal up. And Coney wasn't the main attraction. I mean, we're talking Hearns in Detroit and like all this stuff. And Don Dumpy asked me, Crutch was like, You want them to cancel the whole car for you or something like that? <laughs> yeah, this is Detroit, bro. What are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, like he couldn't, like he asked me, Crutch was like, He was like, You want them to postpone the car for you? <laughs> he was like, Yeah, well, I was hoping they would. <laughs> That's one thing that is sorely, a lot of people might not like uh, Cosell and the way that he dealt with a lot of fighters, but that's one thing that is sorely missed in the world of boxing today is somebody who would just turn to a fighter and be like, dude, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> like, are you fucking joking right now? You're full of shit. You know, cause now everybody's, Oh yeah, you're great. Fucking love you. You know, now that's all it is now. I, I well, missed literally. That. It was basically, I was telling them like, bro, we're in Detroit. You have Kenty on this card. You have Hearns on this. Card. Yeah, this is a Kronk card. Shut yeah, up. Wrong card. You're from New York, bro. You're just an attraction. You really think they're gonna settle this and just wait three months for you to heal up? <laughs> and it always kind of uh, fascinated me too. Back with back to Norton, as far as like his relationship with the punchers and shit. 
I never really understood, like, because he always said that, you know, uh, with Eddie Futch being involved, that he never wanted to fight Joe Frazier. Joe Frazier never wanted to fight him. And I was always kind of just like, why? I, I mean, I get it. Like, they're in the same stable or whatever, but, like, so what? I don't know. I'd fight somebody that I'm training with, if you're, especially if you're I a mean, fucking look, heavyweight championship. Bro, but. Pretty, yeah, look at uh, Maurice Blocker and Simon Brown and others were best friends that fought each other. They got to fight each other. It happens, you know? like iran barkley fought like three of his best friends throughout his yeah. career you know but yeah Absolutely. it's and they go over they hug each other and you know they get over it sometimes it makes them fight even more vicious because of this because yeah, of what i never I understood that you have but yeah i mean i don't think so i honestly had they fought frazier would have decapitated norton that was just a bad style matchup norton was never good with any type of puncher you know it just and frazier's relenting style would have been norton's crab like thing wasn't going to work well for him. I'm sure they sparred countless rounds, but I know Frazier wasn't whooping on him like that. Like he would have been a real fight. It's just, yeah. But um, yeah, those are fights I mentioned because like, those are fights that just don't ever get brought up. You know what I mean? They really don't. Ken Norton, Tex Cobb is not a fight that really got broadcast or shown on television a lot. Um, I don't think by classic sports or anything really for that matter. And you did the Ledoux fight. And both of those were just, Fun ass heavyweight slugfest from a guy that was completely washed up. <laughs> I got it's a good one, and that is a good one. And I, I'm gonna try to squeeze in one final fight that's not a big fight because I brought up big ones. I'll try to squeeze in one that's slightly forgotten, late '90s. So we're spanning a pretty decent, you know, pretty sure. decent spread here, and we're not just focusing on one decade. Uh, but Derek Jefferson versus Maurice Harris. I was gonna bring that up one eventually at some point if I if I didn't run out of time. Yep. <laughs> I mean it's a it's a good fight. I'm not gonna pretend that I know a ton about either fighter. I know more about Maurice Harris than I know about Derek Jefferson, but um, it's a fun fight. It was on a fun heavyweight card, definitely like all timers as far as the results. Um, and basically it's just a, a brawl between two kind of mid tier guys. Uh, one of them who was undefeated at the time and seemed like he had a lot of promise. The other who was not undefeated, but hadn't quite become a full on journeyman yet and was still more known as a sparring partner type of guy than anything, but like stepped up to deliver a surprising performance, frankly, because it looked like Maurice Harris was not going to be up for that kind of fight, but you know, was until the very end. Well, you know, Maurice Harris was one of those guys he turned pro, I want to believe, super duper young. Like, he was a small heavyweight. I'm not even sure if he was a heavyweight when he first turned pro, but, like, he was tiny. He was and that just... was a Kushner card, too. I forgot. That was a yes. fucking Kushner yeah. card. That was one of that was one of Cedric's um, heavyweight Kushner cards. Yeah, uh, heavyweight explosion cards. And so, um, I think Cedric had told me, too, that that was the best heavyweight card that he ever promoted, like, you know, double header. Because it was. The main event was Moscow up against uh, Rockman, right? Yeah, sure. with the results, like that was yeah, a that yeah, was yeah. a fun fight, produced a wild knockout, and then the fucking Jefferson Harris fun fight produced a wild knockout, fucking crazy. So you know the thing that got Maurice Harris going a little bit, like in terms of like popularity, even though he had a bad record, was he scored a he scored a upset win over David Izon, who was undefeated at the time, and Izon was involved in a bunch of fucking fun ass heavyweight fights in the mid nine uh nineties, uh, but um. What got everyone's attention was when he fought Jimmy Thunder. You know, he came in, Maurice Harris came in as just an opponent for Thunder for because Thunder was always being featured on Tuesday night fights. He was such a fun fighter to watch back then, you know. Whether he won or lost, Thunder just made for good fights. Riding high and, after the Crawford Grimsley knockout and shit which yeah, made the rounds you know, on Sports Center and everything. Absolutely. Thunder was just that guy. And this is 1997. He probably had is at his peak of popularity now in terms of possibly getting a big fight too. And because I know he was to like discuss the fight David Tua. And others and stuff like that. So great anyway, name too. I mean, you just got it. Yeah, that shit rolls Jimmy off Thunder? the tongue. Beautiful. Jimmy Thunder. Yeah, Jimmy Thunder. You Fucking don't even need perfect it. for a fighter. Yeah, Jimmy Thunder. <laughs> so change my uh, name to Jimmy Thunder for fuck's sake. <laughs> and he was chiseled too, man. He was just like yoked. But um, yeah, he goes. He fights Maurice Harris, and Maurice Harris come completely just like undresses him, man. I'll box him for every round, and it was a vicious knockout. I think he knocked him out flat on his face. <laughs> So that was a big upset. And like, the thing is, you didn't, it didn't look like a fluke. Like Harris put it on him and out the clearly styled on him and showed that he had skill. Yeah. You he know, put it together. Yeah. 
Yeah, it showed that he had a lot of skill despite his record. So he earned a fight with Larry Holmes after that at Madison Square Garden at the theater. I remember watching that fight live with my dad. And the fight, that was the same thing too. Like he outboxed Holmes that night. Everyone saw it. Everybody knew it. It wasn't a very exciting fight, but it was a fight that like it looked like Harris clearly, you know, controlled for the majority of it. And Holmes got a bullshit decision. So all the stuff that Holmes always crying about, you can't say that he never got his share of, you know, lucky uh, strikes himself, but it's a story for another time. Um, but that's when, after he lost, after he beat, um, lost, after he beat, after he lost to Holmes, that's when he went on a, a really good run from that point. Not beating anybody, you know, worth a really damn or anything like that, looking at the record, but I mean, one the guy he did beat, and I remember watching that too, he came in as a um, substitute, a last minute substitute against Jeremy Williams. And Jeremy Williams, another dude who, like, from the 90s, he wasn't a part of the 92 Olympics, but he was a part of that team, like, that that whole era. Oh, yeah, he's a big amateur, I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When he turned pro, that dude was just, I mean, besides losing, I think, to Larry Donald, he was blasting everyone else out there. You know what I mean? Like, pretty comprehensively, too. Like, he knocked out Danelle Nicholson in two rounds and a bunch of other guys. And, you know, it was was a pretty, was a known fighter. I mean, like, he had got stuff. Great nickname. Yeah. What was his nickname? Half man, half amazing. <laughs> nice. And I know he had lost a couple of times to like Akinwande or whatever, but like he was not expected to lose to Maurice Harris. Like I think Harris was a uh, substitute for Hoskin Rockman or something. He was on like a couple, t- dude, he was, he was big. He was on a couple TV shows. Like he was like, he was popular. I mean, and he was a fun fighter to watch because if you like, if you didn't stymie him, there was a chance he was going to blast your ass out of there really quickly. So. <clears throat> As a, he was expected to do that to Harris, but again, Harris got on. I think this is his HBO debut, and he completely shut down uh, Jeremy Williams. Comprehensively outboxed him, did what he wanted with him, looked like a million bucks, and I think that's the thing that got him his fight with Jefferson. Definitely yeah, was the his fight with Jefferson. <laughs> the the other kind of like sell or the other kind of uh, you know bullet point or whatever about Maurice Harris was that he was Lennox Lewis's sparring partner for a number of years, like one of ah, one of right. his like primary sparring partners or whatever. And so that was, but that was kind of like the easy knock on him or whatever was that he would fall into that sparring partner mode and he would start to just, he was an opponent. Like he would just kind of like play ball with the opponent or with whoever was he was brought in to fight. And so that's why, yeah, like just kind of, you know, he was, he was, he, you could bring him in and you could reliably say like, all right, well, he'll make me look not too bad, but he won't just go away easily. Like he'll give me some rounds, but it ain't going to look like a fucking gimme. And that was in, there's a place for those fighters in the sport. And like you said, what wound up happening was that he strung together some wins and went on a little bit of run. Whereas before, like he'd have like two wins, two losses, get three wins and then lose and then get two wins and then lose that kind of thing. And he just didn't have a very good record and wasn't reliable. And so that little string of losses right there, including against Jeremy Williams was kind of like the, you know, uh, that's what kind of pointed him in this direction. Like, oh, okay, like he's kind of got his shit together. You know, he's he's gotten it together, put it together, and now let's put him in against this undefeated dude, Derek Jefferson, who's had a couple TV performances and a couple knockouts. I mean, it made sense, especially as a co-main event or a co-feature to fucking Maske of Rockman. Well, absolutely. Jefferson came up the Cedric Kushner route, like definitely the heavyweight explosion route. If you look at his record, you see the same names that a lot of other exactly, yeah, exactly on the uh, heavyweight explosion card. You know what I mean? Yeah, he a beat, lot of Obed Sullivan. Yeah, you know that. Levi Billups, Tui Toya, Jeff Lally, Marion Wilson. You know guys like that. Same names that you'd be seeing on a Lorenzo Boyd. Same names you see on a lot of other records. But Jefferson was actually a decent amateur too. I don't have his uh, his complete record, but. I know he beat Devaro Williamson and um, he was featured as one of the prospects on um, uh, New Faces in Ring Magazine. And they mentioned that he beat Michael Grant in the amateurs in that article. And Michael Grant obviously was at like the height of his fame at that point. So that was, you know, that's a notable win for him. But um, he beats Burt, you know, he beat Burt Cooper. Burt Cooper was like really shot by that point but that's still a recognizable name and he beats yeah, a um, couple of fighters kind of used burt cooper as a stepping stone name exactly, at that time. Yeah, actually born yeah and then he beat oh he said he beat obed sullivan i just saw that one and then melvin foster so that 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 trio of wins right there well i guess at that point could get you an hbo date especially if you are an undefeated record and yep. you know cedric has you behind him so 
that is a good fight. Like on paper, it's a good fight to look at. And, you know, I I don't think anybody knew what to expect with it because unless you were really following heavyweight, you know, uh, heavyweight explosion cards, you weren't really going to be seeing anything of Derek Jefferson aside from what was written about him. You know what I mean? So he was more of an unknown, maybe even more so than Harris was because Harris at least was featured on television a couple of times. So I don't, you know, nobody expected what ended up happening, which was just an absolute fucking wild brawl. <laughs> yeah, dude. I mean, it only goes six rounds, not even six full rounds, but you got uh, fucking the second round was like, you know, nearly all timer with both guys down. Mm-hmm. And then, I mean, you could you could definitely see that Harris starts to fade at a couple of different points during the fight. And again, it's only six rounds. But, dude, they're swinging. They're really oh. fucking swinging at each other. And to the point where, uh, you know, Harris is kind of hurt twice. I think he's knocked down a couple more times in either the fourth or fifth round. And then in the sixth round, it's just like the classic, like, caught while swinging type of knockout yeah. where he just gets blasted to the canvas and is out cold. And then out to where in most broadcasts, you're like hearing the commentators like, oh, Oh, no, hopefully everybody's okay. Larry Merchant, Derek Jefferson, I love you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely an all-time call for old Larry, for sure. Oh, for sure. And that was a nasty knockout. Jefferson was on the verge Ooh. of being fucked himself at that point. I was just Yeah, a dude. They were, they was yeah. burning the fucking wick on both ends for both of them. They were just like, somebody's getting knocked out. I became a massive Jefferson fan after that fight. Like, I really did. I thought he was going to be the future. And then in his very next fight, he beats the shit out of David Eisen like a drum for like eight and a half rounds, nine rounds or whatever it was, and just loses any, you know, looks like Sugar Ray Robinson against Joey Maxim in there at the end, just <sighs> like can't do nothing and just gets pushed over and drops. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was incredible to see. It was so a bunch bad. of fights like that in, in the 1990s, dude. Where like just at the end of the fight, the dude just got blasted or some shit. Like there he was just couldn't take like it. That. Like he beat him so badly. It wasn't anything Izod did to him. Izod never landed any eye catching punches on him to really do that. Like a couple of body punches here and there, but it was just Jefferson whooping on him for so long that he just got exhausted from doing it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was one of the best fights uh, that HBO ever put on for boxing after dark or heavyweights and any otherwise. Like it was you know amazing. And I think we're wrapping up here, but like other fights that could be like mentioned. You know, the more popular ones, obviously, like Moore, Cooper, like Michael Moore, Burt Cooper, or you can mention uh, Michael Moore, Alex Stewart. Like, those two are absolute wild. Hell, hell, bro. If Zhang Wilder is good, we'll just come right back and do a fucking part two with yeah, the fucking because, recap. You know, and, like, one I wanted to mention today, too, because it is an, um, Flay Patterson's comeback against George Chivalo. You know, ring fi- uh, ring fight of the year, I think, what was that, 1962 or 63 or so when, they, when he came? No, I'd have to look it up. No, it'd have to be after that, yeah. It would have to be after that, right? Like 64, I don't know. 66, maybe? Hold on. Maybe like 65, 66 or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. But But that fight was an absolute barn burner, too. And then, like, that was Floyd's incredible comeback where he had a, and I think you and I both agreed, he had a better post-career after being champion than he did before because he fought all the guys that everyone accused him of ducking or didn't want to fight, you know what I mean? But, um... And lost a couple that he could have won too. Sure. Or another one too that um one of our followers here, Boxing Journals, Taj, mm-hmm. um he he mentioned the other day too, and I'd forgotten about it. And that's a great one is uh Greg Page, Mark Wills, their first fight. Where Jesus. Greg Page, dude, he had a handful, right? Especially like after his, you know, sure. after his prime or whatever, he had a couple that were bangers. Well, he did. I mean, I sent you the one the other day, too, which was absolutely like, hilarious. And I wouldn't call it <laughs> Alex Slugfest, but just the, the ending of it is just hysterical to me, where he's fighting Terrence Lewis, who was involved in his favorite sl- Slugfest, too. And Lewis throws this wild hook, goes completely over the ropes like that because he just lean, you know, he just leans over it because he threw it so heavy. Stays there for a minute, thinking the referee is going to do something. Paige takes a half a step back while Lewis's back is still to him and goes, it just hits him with a hook and knocks him unconscious. <laughs> it all, he I stops just stand. for a second. Like he's gonna yeah. be like, ref, are you gonna step in? No, you're not gonna bam. Man, yeah. Knocks him clean out. <laughs> well, all's fair in love and war, bro. No, that's yeah. the that's just so, cracking me up though. But no, yeah, that's, this, go ahead. 
No, I was just going to say, dude, that's that's a good one. And uh, like I said, dude, if this shit's a good fight, we'll just come back and talk more. Yeah, slugfest. There is, because there's always there's more to talk about. Definitely. There's only so much you can get into in a couple of hours. <laughs> well, long ass fucking history heavyweight. That's for sure. I was going to bring up the 1731. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going <laughs> to. No, uh, the look, dude. They... Not gonna bring up Death Burke, Simon Byrne. The, yeah, I'm not gonna bring up my fucking Ben Brain. No, yeah, no, we're not going back that far. Um, heavyweight has a fucking long history, though. That's for sure. It's the OG division, and I mean that being said, too, it's one of the most filmed divisions as well. So we've have a lot of examples to draw from as far as great fights extensive fights a lot of you know fighters who have been filmed quite a bit etc so there's no shortage of slugfest dude and it's always fun to talk about fun fights always fun to talk about knockouts heavy hitters etc so i appreciate it man always fun absolutely man always blessed oh i hope that the fight is good i hope everybody enjoys it this weekend stay safe be good behave and if you listen to this podcast with the audio apps and all of those newfangled Delios and whatnot. Go ahead and subscribe. Give us a rating. Leave a comment. We appreciate that. As far as YouTube goes, same thing. Subscribe, comment, et cetera. We will possibly answer back if we like you. If not, that doesn't mean we don't like you, but it also might mean it. So, Eris, <laughs> oh, yeah. I got to drop the whole thing about social media. Knuckles, Knuckles and Gloves podcast yeah. is on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. And we are also on social media. So, go find us. Whatever. Eris, we'll talk soon, bro. Have a good one, y'all.